on a flight that
The committee will come to order, a quorum being present without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Pursuant to Committee Rule 2 and House Rule 11, Clause 2, the chairman may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment for which a recorded vote is ordered. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Moran, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you'll stand with me, please. Thank you all. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 4531, the Support for Patients and Communities Reauthorization Act, for purposes of markup, and move that the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 4531, to reauthorize certain programs that provide for... Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for an opening statement. I have to learn how to push that little button. I've, you know, I'm new here. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the uh, Patients and Communities Reauthorization Act. Drug overdose continues to plague our country. According to the CDC, more than 111,000 people died of drug overdose in the 12-month period ending April. I'm all too familiar with the dire situation since more than 50 miles of the Mexican border is my district, and the growth of fentanyl is so much so that a warehouse once built to house the uh, bulky marijuana is now filled with fentanyl. And that's not years of, of, of production, that's one year of apprehensions uh, that are, are seizures that are leading to uh, uh, hopefully convictions. But those convictions do not stop the flow of it. We are now dealing with what I think uh, is the greatest harm uh, to come along in years, which is an already devastating drug has now been mixed with xylene. That mix uh, of fentanyl and this sedative or tranquilizer doesn't just make it more addictive and more, uh, more quickly uh, absorbed, but it also produces a byproduct, which is, in fact, the outbreak of untreatable wounds. Our, our emergency rooms are regularly dealing with this new concoction having a devastating effect on the very people who tend to live on the streets and are hoping to get off of it. So as we deal with this, we must, in fact, deal with the fatal overdoses and what is now becoming, even if you don't die, debilitating uh, ongoing injuries. Even the DEA recognizes a growing threat of xylene. Uh, when administration, Administrator uh, Milgram discussed the challenges posed by this drug earlier this year, it's time to incorporate xylene as a Schedule III of the Controlled Substance Act and protect our citizens from this deadly drug. In closing, Mr. Chairman, let me make it clear this is not a temporary problem. This is not a drug being abused that might uh, fade away or might become less, less deadly. It is, in fact, a drug historically not taken by human beings that is being abused in a way that will only go away if we ruthlessly and regularly enforce it along with fentanyl. With that, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for an opening statement. <coughs> right. I've got, I've got my Thank hand. you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 4531, the Support for Patients and Communities Reauthorization Act, is a 30-page bill, most of which is not within this committee's jurisdiction. Buried deep within that bill, almost as if the, as if the Republicans thought we wouldn't notice, is a provision that would permanently place xyloxine, a veterinary medicine that is currently not federally controlled, on Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act. We have all seen news reports about addicts who overdosed on fentanyl that was laced with xyloxine. Those stories are deeply disturbing and tragic. Democrats have been committed to fighting the opioid crisis and finding solutions to the issue of fentanyl addiction, which is the problem that this bill is trying to address. 
We have advanced legislation to make it easier for providers to offer medication-assisted treatment to drug addicts and to fund opioid addiction programs in rural areas. And we have passed numerous bills to combat global trafficking of fentanyl and its precursors. But the permanent scheduling of xyloxine is not the answer. We know very little about xyloxine. We know that it is an opioid adulterant, something that is added to an opioid such as fentanyl to prolong its effects and to allow addicts to stretch the supply. We also know that addicts do not use xyloxine on its own. But there is so much more that we do not know. We have never held a hearing on the use of xyloxine, let alone the subject of scheduling it. We do not know the scope of xyloxine use in the US. And critically, we have no evidence that xyloxine is addictive. Yet this bill would permanently schedule xyloxine as a controlled substance, causing a domino effect of harms without any answers to any of these questions. It would be legislating backwards. We already have a process in place for the scheduling of controlled substances. We should follow that process and follow the science. If the medical and scientific evaluation by the experts at the FDA tells us that xyloxine should be controlled, then we will schedule it. By foregoing that analysis, which is what this bill would do, we are simply legislating out of fear, a mistake that we have made too often in the past with devastating consequences. And that is a mistake that we do not need to make here because the xyloxine problem is really a fentanyl problem. The criminals who are manufacturing and distributing fentanyl laced with xyloxine are already subject to prosecution. This bill will add nothing to the enforcement mechanisms that we already have. It's as if we tried to schedule baking soda because addicts use it to cut cocaine. What this bill will do is create a black market with all the risk that entails for a substance that is now freely available. In an apparent concession to corporate ranchers who want to be able to stockpile xyloxine for veterinary purposes, the bill imposes an enormous carve out for xyloxine that is intended for non-human consumption. Consequently, addicts or drug dealers who are looking for xyloxine to make their fentanyl supply last longer will know exactly where to go. We cannot criminalize our way out of an addiction crisis. We have made this mistake over and over again. The war on drugs showed us that scheduling narcotics out of fear and political expediency can have devastating consequences for the most vulnerable in our communities. 50 years later, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. 50 years later, Congress is still trying to fix, this, the crack, to fix the crack cocaine disparity and the mass incarceration that it caused. And we are likely seeing xyloxine in our communities as a result of our crackdown on fentanyl, just as fentanyl replaced heroin and heroin replaced pills. We are playing whack-a-mole, and it is not working. It is possible to address the xyloxine problem with a more effective, more considered approach. We should follow the lead of President Biden, who has recognized that xyloxine poses an emerging threat to our communities, while offering a response plan that does not include permanent scheduling until we know more about the substance. Instead, the President recommends that we focus on treatment, harm reduction, and interrupting the supply of illicitly used xyloxine. The administration recommends that we explore scheduling and other regulatory options without doing an end run around the NDA the FDA and, and, and DEA by jumping straight to permanent scheduling by way of legislation. The administration wants us to follow the science. I understand my colleagues' instinct to do something, anything, to stem the flow of op opioid deaths in this country. It is tempting to think that this bill will do that, but it will not. I hope my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will work together to find a bipartisan solution informed by facts and recent consideration to address the problem of fentanyl laced with xyloxine. Unfortunately, this legislation is not it. I urge my colleagues to oppose the bill, and before I yield back the balance of my time, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record two articles, one called Tracking Trank Laws, the State of Policy Responses to the Growing Xyloxine Crisis, and the other called um, Xyloxine, Animal Tranquilizer in the Drug Supply. Without objection. Thank you, and I yield back. And without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. The chair now recognizes Mr. Issa for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4531 offered Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered base text for the purposes of amendment. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California to explain the amendment. 
Chairman, uh, the amendment speaks for itself. What I want to do is, is respond to the ranking member's statements because I think his statements are, are to a great extent, accurate. One of the inaccuracies, of course, is that the uh, items he put in calls xylazine a crisis, and I'm afraid that calling it a crisis in the, in the very submissions he made and then acting as though we shouldn't act is a problem. Additionally, our, sub, our, our crime subcommittee has dealt with this. In a hearing earlier this year, DEA Administrator Milgram discussed the challenges posed by this drug. She stated, and I quote, even look at xylazine right now, which is something we've been having conversation about, is lacing a fentanyl. Certain states, and I repeat, certain states have now moved to schedule xylazine. It is not yet scheduled in the federal government. So these are challenges we face all the time. Mr. Chairman, these are challenges we face today, which is to deal with the DEA administrators in our oversight, in our appropriate uh, vetting of this, made clear that this is a challenge that, first of all, now is disparate from states, inconsistent, something that we can deal with here in this committee. This is additionally uh, an item where we have looked at it. Now, I'm going to tell a story of my youth. As a college freshman, I dealt with not one, not two, but three of my classmates overdosing on quaaludes. They were, in fact, a veterinary medicine that had been taken out of the University of, uh, of Michigan, University of Michigan Ann Arbor, and these people were taking these tranquilizers that were designed to keep, I guess, cows from getting too excited during birth. I didn't think much of it at the time, except this was a small school, and people dying by taking this drug was a real problem. Was it, was it in fact, something you could easily get if, uh, if you were, uh, had a herd of cattle or, or of cows? Yes, but that didn't change the fact that this was a dangerous drug. In this case, as we regularly look at trying to find the precursors and attack the precursors, we're not looking at, as the ranking member said, the most vulnerable among us. The people we are looking at are the predators who are assembling this deadly drug. And in fact, the making the Schedule Three will give us the opportunity to trace, track, and prosecute those who are assembling not one pill, but thousands or hundreds of thousands of pills that kill every day. It is, in, in, in fact, for the most vulnerable among us that we are today acting to make this a Schedule Three drug. So I would take the ranking member's statements and say he was absolutely right in his statements. He was wrong in his conclusion. Lastly, I went back half a century to uh, people dying uh, of a drug that came out of the veterinary side. Now let's be more current. Every month, I am faced with, as we see homeless people in my own community, I'm faced with seeing those wounds, those wounds on homeless people. In my office, I have a number of pictures, and they're not from homeless people. They're from people in upscale La Jolla who are addicted to these drugs, people who used to be among the most affluent uh, of our society, who now have open sores that cannot heal, and they cannot heal as long as they continue to take the drug laced with this tranquilizer. So not just for the deaths of fentanyl, but for the destruction of families from the very vulnerable to the very wealthy. We have to act now to give the tools to the DEA, as I believe was asked for in, in our hearing. Doing so uh, will, in fact, not affect the vulnerable by their being prosecuted, but in fact, target those who create and assemble these deadly and destructive drugs. Would the gentleman yield for a question? Of course I would yield. Um, I'm sympathetic to what you are trying to do. I do have a concern that we haven't had the a general science review that we have before scheduling and that uh, in such cases we generally do a temporary schedule instead of a permanent. But one of the questions I have is what impact, if any, would this have on 
animal husbandry and the proper use for this uh, chemical. Have we, do we know that? I, I think we do, and I, I appreciate the gentlelady. Very clearly, uh, this, is a, this is a drug currently that should be prescribed by veterinarians and dosed out in less than bulk amount. So there is one uh, concern that has been brought to me that I think is appropriate, and that is would a large uh, operation that, that has a very large amount of it be affected? And the answer is they would have to be in more contact with their vet to make sure that they didn't stockpile large amounts. But other than that, uh, there's no question at all that this could continue. Right now it's prescribed by veterinarians. It will continue to be, uh, but it will be stored in a safer way and accounted for based on whether the doses are in fact appropriate for the, uh, uh, the amount of animal husbandry that's being treated. Gen gentleman's out of time. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Mr. Klein? Move the strike, last word. Um, gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I would ask the gentleman from California if he would uh, yield for a question. Of course. So my reading of the bill, I'm not on the crime sub, um, skipping over Title I, looking at Title II. I'm just reading the appropriate language where this is uh, purporting to move it on the schedule. Does it, in fact, require that it be moved on the schedule, or is it simply directing the DOJ and the FDA and to, to review, provide reports, and then, if appropriate, initiate rulemaking proceedings? Does it give them that option? I thank you for your question. Your, your, your question leads to the exact right answer, which is it only authorizes, gives them the authority. In fact, as the ranking member said, administration, administration. This will be a decision by the administration. Uh, we're simply creating the authorization to, uh, to do that based on the science. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Maryland. Do you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Issa, uh, I co-sponsored a similar bill uh, that was um, offered by Mr. Panetta, H.R. 1839. I think it had some similarities, but it uh, really was just targeted at uh, providing penalties. I, I, I wondered if the chair had a chance to, to take a look, because I, I, I didn't realize that this was sort of essentially the same topic and area. Has the, has the gentleman had a chance to compare the two bills? Yes, uh, and, I, and I appreciate the question of gentleman would yield. The, uh, uh, Penalties of being Schedule Three in violation would come in harmony if the administration chooses to make it a Schedule Three drug. Uh, so it is not just sympathetic, but would accomplish substantially the same thing. And uh, Congressman Panetta, I think, envisioned upping it. But you know, we're we're looking at giving the administration the ability not only to put it in a category where the penalties would apply, but also have the control systems that would come with it being a Schedule Three drug, which is a big part of what we're empowering the administration to consider. And if I could re reclaim my time briefly, with respect to the issue of whether it's permanently scheduled or temporarily scheduled, uh, my quick review of this is that this is aimed at uh, permanent scheduling on, uh, on Schedule Three. I thank the gentleman. It authorizes the permanent scheduling, of course, uh, one of the things that, that in my 23 years here I've learned is no laws are permanent. <laughs> all things are relatively and can be changed. Uh, and, and no question at all, at a future time, there could be a, a decision to uh, encourage the administration to, to, to change the classification. They would have the authority to do that themselves. We're not ordering this to be Schedule Three. We are authorizing them to make that decision. And so, uh, in a sense, yes, it is permanent, but it only authorizes to be permanent. But I thank the gentleman. Yield back. Thank you. I, I've taken a look at, geez, let's see, page 22 of the bill. I don't know if that's the same one I've got. Um, and this would be line, lines 19 through 23. And so, um, just to read it quickly, I, I, Running out of time. Schedule three in section 202C of the Controlled Substance Act, I'll skip the site, is amended by adding at the end of the following, quote, F, xylazine, period, close quotes. So 
what's the what's the chair's understanding of the meaning of that language? Uh, if you flip to the next page, 23, and you see the reports, including one year after, uh, that, and that includes where the drug is being diverted, where the drug is being, uh, uh, is being originated, and so on. It, it, you take, it's not, it doesn't end at 22. It, it's in context would, the whole next page. Would the gentleman yield? It's the gentleman's time. Yes. Jim? Yeah, I think, what, I, I think what it means is that xyloxine is permanently scheduled albeit there is a report later, but meanwhile it's permanently scheduled, not temporarily scheduled. I yield back. I just to reclaim my time. Um, so Chairman Issa, would, just given the colloquy we just had, I'd, I'd be more comfortable with uh, legislation in the way that you had described it, uh, and if, there, if we could clarify this language so that it sounded more like what, what you were saying. In other words, we were giving the authority to uh, the DEA uh, to, to decide, or whoever, to decide whether it should be on Schedule 3 or not, rather than manda mandating it by statute, I'd be a lot more comfortable. No, and with, with if the, the gentleman would yield. I, I would uh, yield. The, I, you know, I know we're, we're looking at a nuance, and it's an important nuance. We are authorizing them to create permanent Schedule 3. We are not mandating them. The administration could choose to come back to us and say, we're uncomfortable, we're not going to make it Schedule 3. So the reality is, if they choose to make it Schedule 3, we see this as it should be permanent. But there, there is a consultation, and again, you know, this is one of those odd situations where the ranking member, uh, bless his heart, believes that the administration hasn't acted, and we're just simply empowering the administration to act with a trust that they will make the right decision, and I yield back. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time is running out, but if, if uh, uh, just for a oh, quick yield, yes, this is not an <coughs> authorization. This puts this drug permanently on the list, and maybe that in the end will be the right result. But we don't have any of the normal background information. This is not like an authorization. This puts it on, on the list. The gentleman's out. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's out. Wait, 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 wait. I. I I, I thank the chair and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who, who seeks recognition? Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen, seek recognition? Gentleman's recognized. Thank you. This does put it on the schedule, Schedule 3, and Mr. Issa says it would authorize the FDA. I don't think the FDA has to be authorized to do anything. They have the right and the duty to look at any drug and see how it would be scheduled. And I would hope this caption is large enough. I'm having my staff is looking into it to amend this to make it a much better bill to list cannabis as a Schedule Three drug, something they should have done many, many, many years ago because we waste a lot of money with that and we need research, et cetera. And this would require them to do what they have not done in the past. And so I'd ask if uh, Mr. Issa has considered the, the, the capacity of this bill to carry a, a, a cannabis uh, Schedule Three listing as well. Would, would the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, I think I want to make sure that, that we are clear because we believe that, yes, we're, we're, we're ordering in this bill a Schedule 3. With, if you look at page 23, what we're actually going is we're saying within a year we can, in fact, move this if the DEA recommends so. This, this, I mean, this is a strange situation in which we know this is a deadly and debilitating drug. We know that we want to go after the people who assemble, and this empowers that drug to be controlled in that way. But we also know that the DEA, if they feel it's uh, inappropriate after one year, this, this is not permanent in that sense that it can never be relooked at. In fact, their reports and their recommendation would be relooked at. Uh, and I think we have to have some trust that, that we, this is why we give the DEA the authority we do and why this report envisions one year, uh, Congress would have to act uh, within one year. And that's, that's really why I said tw page 22 has to be looked at by complete reading of page 23, which I believe gives us that temporary nature, if appropriate, but not temporary today, uh, so that we must reauthorize uh, in a short period of time, which is I'm going to reclaim my time, Mr. Issa, because my question to you was the 
amending this bill to make it a much better bill to have cannabis classified as Schedule Three, which would save hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Americans with charged with crimes that are recognized in most states more than this drug as being legal and being a medical use, and the FDA has just dropped the ball on it. I've been told by the par if the gentleman would yield. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been told by the parliamentarian that it's not germane, uh, sufficient to uh, to amend the bill. I, I share with you the fact that we do have a separate problem, which is the disparate laws uh, throughout our country, where you have this this drug that has been uh, made made the equivalent of the most deadly drugs, and yet it's legal in so many of our states, including mine. So I share with you that. I'm happy to work with you on, on separate legislation, uh, but I, I'm told by the parliamentarian we can't add it to this. Mr. Issa, I want to thank you for your consideration. I look forward to working with you on that. I was pleased to yield to you, and the opportunity I had to yield to you the last time, I didn't realize it was you when I said that, but it was still on a roll, but I, you're my friend, and if I'd have known it was you, I would have found a more nuanced way to have done it. I yield back. <laughs> Gentleman yields back on that roll. Uh, who seeks recognition? Ms. Sparts, generally is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, uh, Representative Iser, you know, uh, for one thing, if we could add, and maybe we can do it with mil Bill moves further. I think this is a very serious issue, and we're authorizing more money, and it's important for us to deal with this uh, issue, but also it's important for us to have accountability and reporting that actually does benefit the people that get this treatment. So what I would like to ask if we could also add another reporting requirement where actually we can report how much money is spent per each person receiving this treatment. Because I've seen like when I calculate Medicaid dollars in the state of Indiana, we spend 100,000 per person per year and people are not getting the best care. So I want to make sure that actually it goes to the people and benefit the people that would try to provide this treatment and not just pay big salaries and big bureaucracy. So I would appreciate if Mr. Issa would uh, work with me and see if we can add that additional requirement. And as accountant, I think these numbers are very important for Congress to make these decisions that money are properly spent. Would the gentlelady yield? Yes, I yield to Mr. Issa. I absolutely would be delighted to work on, and we could both send a letter and follow up with the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, which that part of the bill is in their jurisdiction, but I think the gentlelady is right, and I'm happy to work to, uh, to see that it's put in by the committee. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, gentlelady from California is recognized. Ms. Lofgren? No? Uh, Mr. Cray. Mr. Cray is recognized. Five minutes. Chairman, move to strike the last word. Yes, gentlemen, recognize. And to my colleague from California, I, I agree with you. This is a very deadly drug when abused but it has legitimate uses. So I'm trying to figure out your legislation, how would that advance, minimize its abuse? Because how does this drug get from the veterinarian's office to the streets of a city to be abused? I would gentlemen yield. How does your legislation minimize that probability? I, uh, Thank you for yielding. The, the, the fact is that, that, that you're hitting the nail on the head. We're not going after the drug when it's in a pill. We're going after the people who are in, the, in the, the supply chain getting it into the fentanyl, mixing it. Uh, this, drug, this drug, in fact, will continue to be prescribed and, and available for animal husbandry appropriate. It's an effective tranquilizer. It has to be used infrequently even on animals. Uh, but by making it a Schedule Three, by having it there, it means we can attack a precursor that is being used that is both deadly and debilitating. We can attack it on those who are, who are dealing with it in bulk. If you're a vet and you've got, I'm going to use a hypothetical, a pound of it, uh, and that's 10,000 doses, there's something wrong. On the other hand, you'll still have a wholesaler that has pounds of it. You'll still have vets that have uh, appropriate doses of it. And you'll still have the individual uh, uh, farmer, rancher, who will have uh, prescribed amounts of it. This is no different than any other prescribed drug. What we're really able to do is, is to <laughs> seize 
large amounts that are found and to prosecute for possession of that, as long as it's in the supply chain and being legally prescribed, there's no crime. So would you be looking at the manufacturer or the wholesaler? Seizing it is one thing, but where would you be seizing it from? The gentleman's point of further yield is, is exactly right. As a Schedule III controlled drug, we will start with the, the DEA will start with the manufacturer. You now have a Schedule III drug. You have this reporting requirement. We look at the distribution. The fact is we expect, and, and this is just me talking as someone with a border district, but uh, Congressman's been there uh, with me over the years, we are going to be looking probably at Chinese-made going into Mexico, coming over our border. We, we will be, in fact, working on the supply chain, much of it clandestine. If I may, what are the probability of a legitimate user, a farmer getting in trouble for having an excess amount of this medication in their farm? The chances would only be if, there, if the DEA finds a diversion where he's buying in, in large quantity and diverting. Um, it is unlikely that, uh, that someone's going to have that. But of course, you could have somebody who gets into being part of the supply chain because they can buy it for a dollar and sell it for 10, not to put it into the animal. Uh, but that is, that, is a, that is certainly a possibility. I know that the gentleman knows that most of the fentanyl trans combination are actually originating uh, in Mexico. Uh, but there will be there will be some domestic, and, and of course we want to go after that. I'm just concerned about the probability of a legitimate user being caught up in the criminal justice system, and then having major issues. And if the gentleman further yield, yes. Every veterinarian is dealing with a number of drugs, some of them Schedule Three, that in fact go to horses, cows chickens, whatever it happens to be. So this simply falls into that same control. The gentleman's absolutely right. Everyone who has a, has a large farm deals with the vet on a regular basis and does have to control the, the drugs that they're using for their animals. It doesn't change it to some sort of a drug that can only be administered by the, by the vet in, in, you know, in a, in a a hospital situation, it's still going to be a drug that, that goes that. It simply empowers when they find a diversion or they find a bulk amount that, has, that might have originated in, in, uh, in China and, in fact, never went through the factory system. And that's the drug they'll be trying to find. Would the gentleman yield? Go ahead. I just wanted to say that uh, I have an amendment which I think will satisfy the gentleman's concerns and, in fact, concerns expressed by everybody so far. I yield back. With the gentleman further yield. Of course, three seconds. This is, one of the, this is one of those things where we want to do what the Biden DEA is asking us to do, which is empower them to have a tool. It came out of a legitimate hearing, and uh, I think before it goes to the floor, I would expect that the Biden DEA could weigh in. And, you know, if, if I'm wrong and they weigh in that they don't want this bill, I wouldn't be surprised that it, it dies. But I believe that they will be supportive, and they were supportive in, in our hearing. Gentlemen's time's expired. D does yet another Californian seek recognition? Mr. Mr. Lewis, recognized for five minutes. No, sir, not you. Down there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I move this right to the last word. I have some questions for Representative Issa. Uh, if your bill became law, would people still be able to do medical research on this drug? General would yield? Yes. yes. And currently, you don't need a prescription for the use of this drug? Uh, no, it is, it is a prescribed drug. So if it becomes, under your bill, becomes Schedule 3, what, does it put any additional burdens on the veterinarian? Science researchers. None. They, they, they prescribe other Schedule 3 drugs. Okay. And then I'm just trying to understand what you've said about the bill and the language I'm reading, and because you said it authorized administration, and then when I read on page 22, it says placement of xylazine on Schedule 3, and it says Schedule 3 is amended by adding at the end of the following xylazine. It doesn't seem like the administration has discretion. It seems like it's just added. And I'm just if trying the, to understand. If the gentleman would yield, that's the reason that you have the year 
and so on. Yes, it will go to Schedule Three. The administration, uh, in fact, in that one year can, ha can say, no, it shouldn't be Schedule Three any longer. Here's the reason. Well, the general Congress yeah. can act. That's why I said no yeah. law is permanent, even if you right. put something on a permanent schedule. Uh, I appreciate that. So, I'm just. Well, the gentleman. Yeah. I would like. I would like the bill to say that. So, where does it say that? I, I, where does it say the administration can sort of reject xylazine? Well, gentleman, yield. Uh, yes. I. I uh, when I, think, I asked I, my initial. I think the if the gentleman would further yield. Yes. A, a year later, the. Within the year, we can act again. It, it does, in fact, put it on the schedule, but it also says that the administration can recommend and we can act to re reduce it. And that's the reason that I said no law is permanent. Well, so I, if you just point me to the page where it says that, I... I it's page I, 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 Yes, I'll yield. I, I thank the gentleman. The, the earlier colloquy when I raised the uh, possibility that this was optional for the administration after Mr. Ivey's questions, I relooked at it. It looks like it does go ahead and uh, put it on Schedule Three. But then, right after that, on line on page 22, line 24, report to Congress on xylazine. It says an initial report, additional report, and it asks for recommendations with respect to whether xylazine should be transferred to another schedule. So it says, go ahead and schedule it. Put it under Schedule Three and then get reports as to whether it should be moved. It doesn't give them that power to move it. It says come back to Congress if you want to move it, but give us reports back on whether that's successful on Schedule 3. I agree. We don't want to jump to put something on a Schedule 3 that doesn't need to be, um, but uh, since this was the subject of a, of a hearing in subcommittee, I'm going to uh, yield to my colleagues as, as to whether it does need to be on Schedule 3. Uh, so let I Yield reclaim back. my time. Uh, so let me just say this. I think you can get a very strong bipartisan vote if that issue was just clarified. I think, I think we want to, I think many mem Democrat members want to support this bill. I, I think Chairman Adler may have a, or Ranking Member Adler may have a amendment, but I, I, I think we're trying to, to get to yes on this. And, if you could if help the us. Would, would, would the gentleman yield? The gentleman would yield. I'll, I'll yield to Representative Lofgren. Uh, I, I want to clarify that the only exemption is for uh, animal husbandry. There isn't an exemption for science research. And so I do, I do think there is an interference with the potential scientific research under this bill. And as has been mentioned by our friends across the aisle, this is permanently put on Section 3. And yes, there'll be a report in a year, but it would take an additional act of Congress to change it. So it's really not... Uh, we don't have, it's not discretionary, it's not, uh, the, the uh, scientists would not be able to change it without an additional act of Congress, and of course, that wouldn't be possible because the scientists would be precluded from studying it under the bill. I, I'm eager, actually, to, to do something about this, but I think there are is, there is some problems with the bill as drafted, and especially speaking as a member of the Science Committee, the constraint on scientific research I think is unwise, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Would, would the gentleman further yield? I'll further yield, yes. Uh, I think what we have is a, a, a failure to agree that we can get to, and, and here's how I'd like to get to it. Energy and Commerce unanimously voted this out, Republicans and Democrats. Clearly, we have a joint jurisdiction situation, but I think it's one in which I can make the commitment on behalf of the, the full committee chair that we will not move this to the bill and uh, to the floor until we have worked with energy and commerce to clear up the questions, particularly of, uh, of scientific use. And I, I think we have to recognize that it's, it, it, well, it could well be also their jurisdiction, but I'm happy to, to guarantee that we will work with them in consultation to make sure this bill only moves if it still allows that exactly what you're asking for, full and complete access for scientific research. I've, Thank you. I've, My time I've has expired. I've got to intervene and quote Henry Hyde, who oh, said... I, I will allow that, yes. That <laughs> the Democrats, Henry said the Democrats are our adversaries. The Energy and Commerce Committee is our enemy. <laughs> <laughs> well played. The gentlelady from California. Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition. Yes. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk, which I think will clear up most of this. Clerk will report the amendment. <laughs> 
Uh, I'd reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4531 offered by Mr. Nadler of New York. W without objection, the amendment in the nature of an amendment. Uh, what? Sorry. The, the amendment will be considered as read. Be considered as read. We'll do that. Gentleman's Gentleman recognized. Thank amendment. you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment would make the schedule of xylexine immediate but temporary rather than permanent. So it wouldn't require an act of Congress to undo it. This is how we address fentanyl-related substances. There is no reason to act more severely, more rationally, and with less information about a substance that is an additive rather than the actual opioid itself. This amendment would require the Attorney General and the Secretary of HHS to study the scheduling of xylexine under the Controlled Substances Act. <coughs> Excuse me. It will allow us to regulate xylexine immediately while giving us time to get the scientific and medical evaluations we need to make an informed decision about permanent scheduling. We can hold hearings to assess how prevalent xylexine use is around the country, what the consequences of scheduling will be, and whether there should be broad exceptions. As it stands now, there are legitimate questions about whether xylexine should be scheduled at all. There are questions about the impact of having a carve-out to scheduling for xylexine intended for non-human use. The process outlined by the Controlled Substances Act will answer those questions. It will allow us to avoid the mistakes we made when we listened to those who told us incorrectly that crack was more dangerous than powder. We are still trying to right that wrong. This amendment would achieve the goal of immediate regulation of xylexine while obtaining the information we need to make sound policy going forward. It represents a reasonable compromise that I urge my colleagues to support. It, in fact, a answers the questions that have been raised here, the objections that have been raised by most people. Xylexine will be controlled immediately, um, but temporarily, and we would have the choice after a year with all the advice that we would have gotten in the interim of scheduling it permanently or saying, no, we shouldn't. So I urge the adoption of this uh, uh, amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Does the gentleman insist on his point of order? No, I withdraw the point of order. Point of order withdrawn. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the amendment. It was back in uh, 1971 when Congress exercised its, its authority and created uh, uh, the schedules uh, that uh, we are working with today in terms of drugs. And marijuana at that time was placed on Schedule 1. And so since that time, it has been demonstrated time and time again that marijuana or cannabis does not belong on Schedule 1, but we cannot seem to muster the ability here in Congress to remove it. And so uh, the same thing will happen to any other uh, substance, any other drug that Congress decides to uh, place on a schedule as opposed to allowing the FDA to do its job and to uh, make the call. And so I think that this amendment uh, is a good one. I'm also concerned about the fact that when we place another drug on uh, Schedule 3, uh, there are criminal penalties associated with uh, possession, with possession with intent, with sale, with trafficking. Um, and uh, what tends to happen is uh, possession cases tend to be made on those at the lowest end of the totem pole. It's the user, the person who is addicted. And so what we do is criminalize what is really a public health issue. And we criminalize it by uh, uh, placing uh, convictions on the records of uh, nonviolent people who tend to be located in the inner cities of our country. And so we end up having uh, folks with criminal records who can't get student loans, who are not eligible for public assistance, who uh, are barred uh, from various professional occupations because of the, uh, the, the mark of being a convicted felon. And so this is a way of expanding the uh, portal or the uh, entry into the criminal justice system and permanent stains on, 
on people who are, uh, are unable at that point after being convicted to rise to their highest level. And at the same time, they're getting no treatment for uh, the underlying condition that allowed them or, or caused them to uh, fall into this possession uh, trap. And so I'm worried about over-criminalization. I'm worried about, um, uh, uh, well, I support this amendment, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Chairman. Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald is recognized for five minutes. Uh, strike. Uh, let, me, let me just go back. I wish I would have spoken with Congressman Guthrie about this um, before our uh, markup today. I, I'm, I'm assuming that it emerged from um, the involvement of the uh, state of Kentucky in horse racing. That's an assumption on my own part. But I know that, that obviously the drug that, uh, that Zan, uh, Zanaldine is used in that industry. But with that being said, let me just kind of bring things back to where we're at. This is from the DEA Joint Intelligence Report, October 2022. The expanded use of xalazine as an adulterant may be driven in part by its low cost and lower risk of law enforcement scrutiny as it is not a controlled substance. It's from the DEA. Moreover, its addition to fentanyl can increase the profit for traffickers and attract additional customers. It is difficult to assess with certainty how widespread the use is or the true number of xanazine involved in overdose deaths without expanded testing, okay? But they know it's, ha it's happening all the time. The emergence uh, across the United States appears to be following the same path as fentanyl, beginning with white powder heroin markets in the Northeast before spreading to the South and then working its way into drug markets westward. This pattern indicates the use of xanazine as an adulterant will likely increase and become commonly encountered in the illicit fentanyl supply. Xanazine use throughout the United States may also follow the pattern seen in Puerto Rico and emerge as a drug of abuse on its own in the future, although it's unlikely to replace fentanyl or other opiates among illicit drug users. So, I, I mean, this stuff is nasty. And if it has that effect on animal husbandry, the veterinary industry, then that's something to deal with at a later date. But right now, this stuff is moving as quickly as fentanyl across the US. And, and all this talk this morning about well, you know, we hate to see it uh, move to Schedule 3, and then later on we'll have to revisit it. I mean, I, it just seems that I, I'm shocked by the um, insignificant notice of, of uh, the urgency here. Would we, the gentleman I mean, this yield? This stuff is moving right now. So. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, I would yield. I would point out that the amendment uh, takes, uh, satisfies the gentleman's concern. It immediately schedules xylexine. It, places on the controlled substances list immediately, uh, and then orders various studies. At, at the end, of, at the end of, a, of a year, it would be removed from the list unless Congress, having been uh, uh, convinced by those studies, decides it should stay there. But it would immediately place it on the controlled substances list, so that would satisfy the gentleman's concerns. It would immediately place it on the list, and we'd have a year to study it. Well, I yield my, back. My, my point is that uh, there just seems to be uh, kind of this lack of urgency amongst Congress to address this issue. Uh, th this is something that we have been well aware of. DEA underscored this, found it important to put out this joint intelligence, intelligence report in 2022. So I, I, we need to take action on this, and we need to do it today. Would the gentleman yield? Would the gentleman yield? Well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, I might mention uh, for context, 2024 is just around the corner, and that's when we're going to, quote, have to deal with the temporary nature of fentanyl as Schedule 3. We made a mistake by not recognizing a drug that is responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths, thousands in my district, tens of thousands or more in my state 
last year, that drug is temporary. And in fact, the DEA wants it permanent. I'm hoping that when it comes up for a reconsideration that we finally make it permanent. But today we are considering a drug that was on no one's radar until it became part of a deadly drug being more deadly, more addictive, and debilitating uh, because of the sores that it, and, and the nature, the untreatable sores it creates. That's the reason we're dealing with it. It's the reason that we know that it's not going to be temporary in its nature as long as fentanyl is plaguing us, and it's an additive for fentanyl and other drugs. Would the gentleman yield? It's the gentleman's time. Oh. I yield back. Would the gentleman's out of time, yields back. Does the ranking member seek recognition? Yes, I do. The gentleman's recognized? It moves to strike the last word. Recognized for five minutes. I'd just like to point out to Mr. Issa that this amendment does exactly what you're talking about. It immediately places uh, uh, um, um, Xylex, Xyle, whatever have you finished, Xylexine, Xylexine, yeah. Xylexine on, the, um, on the control list, order studies, and Congress having the, benef the benefits of those studies a year from now can decide whether to permanentize it or not. But we're not taking any chances. We're not endangering anybody. We're putting it on the controlled substance list immediately. So I would think, I would hope there should be consensus that the best thing to do is not to rush to judgment as we have uh, in the past on, on some drugs to our, to our regret, but it immediately places it on the, uh, on, on, on the list now, gives us time to consider and to decide what to do in a year. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, look, I, I think we are talking two sides of a coin here. I, I agree that we don't want to uh, drag our feet and, I and, and so on, but I believe that fentanyl being still temporary and having to go through reauthorization, when everyone in this room knows that the, 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 the numbers are in and it is scary how dangerous it is, and now this is what's made it even more so. So I want to correct next year, I want to correct the problem with fentanyl being temporary. I don't want to make the same mistake here. ENC, on a bipartisan basis, you, uh, a voice vote, literally made the same decision, which is this, because it is a precursor or a product that is being mixed with fentanyl, needs to be a Schedule three, the re same as fentanyl. Re 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 reclaiming my time. Yes, but we don't want to make the same mistake we made with regard to crack cocaine as opposed to cocaine. Um, we are going to, I assume, uh, in a year or whenever that comes up, make uh, fentanyl permanent. And this says we're making, we're putting a, a, a xylexine on the list now, and probably about the same time with it, uh, we, we consider fentanyl for permanency, we can consider this for permanency, and it's our decision. But let's not jump to judgment. Be safe by not automatically making it. It'll be prohibited from day one, uh, and it's up to us a year from now to decide whether uh, the evidence shows we should make it permanent or not. I don't see how anyone c could object to that. Uh, on the one hand, it gives us the ability to, to deal with it as we're dealing with fentanyl. On the other hand, it gives us the ability to uh, avoid the mistake we made with crack cocaine. Chairman, would, would the, the gentleman yield? further yield. Yes. Um, you know, I guess my problem is that I'm looking at the history of fentanyl being kicked down the road time and time again and saying we need to learn from this mistake. That's the reason we're doing this in a way in which the administration can come back to us and, and ask us to, to reconsider it the other way. But knowing that fentanyl and this drug are not only deadly, but right now we are giving out for free and putting on the streets of, of San Diego, Meloxalan, the, this, this miracle drug that when you're dead, they pump it into you and you come back to life after you've overdosed on, on, uh, on fentanyl. This drug is making that less effective. Less people are coming back from the de dead or near dead because of this drug. This drug is more addictive, more quickly, and oh, by the way, the antidote that is, has been saving lives. Which drug, fentanyl or? or, or the xylazine. Xylazine. Uh, makes you less responsive to come back from fentanyl overdose. And we're, we're dealing with the fact that more people are dying because of this. We, and, we, you know, reclaiming, imagine, my, reclaiming my time. That's exactly why we're prohibiting it immediately. And if, if the gentleman's fears are, are, are 
are, are borne out after the appropriate uh, FDA and other research, we'll ban it permanently. Will, will the ranking member yield for a moment? Sure. Um, my understanding is that fentanyl, you know, part of the reason it's on the status that it is currently is because there are legitimate uses and the point was to, to work their way through it before there was a decision about making it permanent or not. I think with respect to this, uh, we know a lot less about, or I do anyway, xylazine uh, than we know about fentanyl. I think, and I think in, you know, Chairman Issa, in part of what you're saying, you're, you're sort of conflating uh, fentanyl and xylazine in a way that I don't know makes sense for us with respect to the final determination of whether xylazine should be permanently scheduled or not. I'd separate fentanyl out. I know it's used uh, as a mix, I'm, but there are examples. I, for ex PCP, for example, was frequently mixed with tobacco uh, and other types of... Oh, you all might not know what PCP is, but it's an animal tranquilizer that uh, was a major problem in, in the D.C. area. It didn't spread around the country, but it was addictive, uh, deadly, and also caused uh, long-term health damages, uh, including, you know, mental health damage, like schizophrenia and the re like. Re reclaiming my time for a moment. Um, the time's expired. I know. Okay. But just re <laughs> reclaiming my time just for a moment. Saving the climate doesn't I'll, have I'll, 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 I'll point out that everybody's concerns seem to be... Uh, taken care of by this amendment because it bans it immediately. Research is done by the FDA and whoever else, and we're trusting us, ourselves, to make a decision on its permanence a year from now. I yield back. Gentlemen's time is expired. I yield like, back. Mr. Chairman, I, I move the like. recognition. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, is I'm sorry. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Ice. I'm going to give you a compliment. I know that you are well committed to these issues. Uh, and um, as well as the members collectively. This comes under our subcommittee, uh, and I would like to make a pronouncement that uh, we are fighting fentanyl in the street, um, and none of us want fentanyl to be at the level that it is. And I think my colleague from Maryland, and I know my colleague from New York, made points uh, that fentanyl uh, can be found in hospitals. So we have a challenge. Uh, with respect to xylazine, uh, I don't want to profess uh, scientific and medical training, but it is my understanding that it is not addictive or we do not have enough information about that, but I respect your concern, Mr. Issa. And I truly believe that we have found uh, common ground in the amendment by Mr. Nadler because I don't know whether law enforcement, DEA, has had their opportunity for analysis, whether FDA has had their opportunity, and whether any uh, elements of HHS that would need to assess and any other agency have had their ability to analyze for the permanent labeling, or scheduling, rather, of xylazine. So I would make the argument of scheduling xylazine uh, temporary rather than permanent exactly the type of measured response that we need to combat the opioid epidemic. It mirrors how we approach uh, fentanyl, though, again, let me make a breaking news statement. Uh, it is um, a lowest of low fentanyl in its devastation and its ability to kill, uh, but we must move on that with facts because it does have other uses. As I said, walk into a hospital and you'll find medical professionals using it and saying they need it for the patients and the care that they are giving. We knew far more about those substances when we decided to temporarily schedule them, uh, meaning fentanyl and other substances opioid related, than we know about xylazine. Uh, we lose nothing, absolutely nothing, by making the scheduling decision temporary your concerns are answered. Uh, DH, um, DHH will have the ability to do scientific evaluation that we need before making a permanent scheduling decision. Um, and we will not have legislated in haste. We may even give some ground movement for the fentanyl scheduling. And we already know the devastating consequences of attaching criminal penalties to drugs without complete information about their impact. 
we made that mistake, and this committee has dealt with it, and we remember uh, our former chairman who spent a lot of time on dealing with the question of opioid uh, expansion, addiction, wave. It was, uh, it was overwhelming. And we produced out of this legislation an opioid pre uh, prevention bill, uh, but it did not stop the tide of the disparities between crack cocaine and the prisons that were filled up in particular by African Americans and Latinos and others and young people. So rather than coming back years from now to correct mistakes that could cost people their liberty, we can take one simple step in making a xylazine schedule temporary. I really think, Mr. Iser, uh, knowing your commitment and serious uh, concern that this allows us to take an action today without creating long-term um, irretrievable steps that we can get, get back. My colleagues who support the scheduling of xylazine can have no reason basis for opposing this amendment. Uh, nothing in this amendment stops Congress from making the scheduling decision permit tomorrow. Should the scientific evidence show that permanent scheduling is warranted, all this amendment does is give us our options while we gather the information. And while it is temporary, you're still getting the impact that you desire, uh, which is to ensure the uh, lack of abuse and that those who need to be protected are protected. So, breaking news as I conclude, I abhor fentanyl. It is killing people. It is dangerous. Uh, and we need to move quickly on getting the continued assessment. But repetitively, redundantly, today's hospitals and medical professionals use it. So how do we find that even line? Today, we can deal with this uh, particular uh, drug um, and get where we need to go by this temporary provision. And xylazine will be not openly used without penalty. I ask my colleagues to support the Nadler Amendment. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chairman, seeks recognition. Move the strike last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping to speak last, but you never know. Uh, I, think, I think there's been a lot. You never, never know. I, I believe there's been a lot of good debate, and I believe the debate has, has strengthened my belief that we should not make this one year temporary uh, in the way that uh, Ranking Member Nadler wants to. And, and here's the reason. I heard my, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle unanimously saying fentanyl is terrible, it's deadly, we need to fight it, it is killing over 100,000 people a year, it is debilitating many more because of xylazine. We're saying that at a time in which we still have fentanyl as temporary because we made it temporary initially and we've, we've been unwilling to touch that hot stove again more than making it temporary, kicking it down the road. This is not a temporary problem. I don't want to sound uh, overly hyperbolic, but none of my constituents are temporarily dead. They're permanently dead. Their families are permanently devastated. The damage is permanent. And this drug is deliberately being re repurposed into making fentanyl more deadly, fentanyl more addictive, and fentanyl less able to be recovered from on an overdose. In, my, in my, uh, one of my counties, we are presently trying someone for murder and trying to make it murder to make someone believe that they were taking a legal drug when in fact it was fentanyl mixed with xylazine. It was fentanyl that killed a young co-ed who thought she was simply taking half a pill to in fact get her homework done and, and, and do better uh, in, in college. And she was, she was trying to avoid a higher price pharmaceutical that she thought it was, she just thought she was buying a Canadian pharmaceutical. She's dead, and she's permanently dead. So I am being a little hyperbolic. This is making people more likely to be permanently dead from fentanyl. I do not believe, not here and not in my district, that anyone is going to be prosecuted for having a dose of, of xylazine. 
They're going to prosecute people who are moving this as part of a precursor, in fact, because they are mixing it, because they are scoring it for that purpose. Nobody's, right now, if, when this appears, it appears, it never, it never has a reason to be in the hands of, of some poor uh, uh, underserved person on the street. They're not taking this as a tranquilizer. They're getting this in pill form, mixed with other drugs to make it more addictive. And that's the reason it needs to be and will continue to be a drug. Now, will they switch to some other drug uh, that has a similar effect if they can find one? Yes. Will it be whack -a Yes. But as long as we do not secure the, the distribution of this drug as a precursor to make fentanyl more deadly, we will not solve it. And yes, I am committed to make fentanyl a permanent, not a temporary Schedule Three drug so that we yield? can prosecute. Of course, I uh, yield to the right. Thank you. I am committed to making fentanyl a uh, permanent drug, too. But I would simply point out with respect to the amendment. The amendment makes um, um, xylexine uh, controlled immediately. It lets us study whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. And a year from now, it's up to us again. Um, we have learned that we should certainly make fentanyl permanent. We may learn that we should certainly make xylexine uh, permanent, or we may learn that we shouldn't. It gives us the power a year from now, and that's why this amendment is, is the right thing to do, because it, it immediately, there's no danger right away because it immediately schedules it, um, but then the appropriate studies are done, which have never been done before, and we'll find out whether, like uh, marijuana, cannabis, it never should have been scheduled, or whether, like fentanyl, it should certainly be scheduled, and that'll be up to us. So I, I, so I urge the adoption of the amendment, and I yield back to the gentleman. And, and I, reclaiming and closing out my time, I don't know that this will carry the day, but Mr. Nadler, I will work with you between now and the floor with Energy and Commerce, which I have more faith in perhaps because I served for two years on that committee, uh, to make sure that, that we do look at, at whether there is a, uh, a compromise that we could do along with our sister committee. But I, I do believe that if we, if we had the power unlimited today to say we were going to make both of these drugs permanent, that we would have a hard time making fentanyl permanent when we all know we should. And so that's the reason that I, I reluctantly will oppose this amendment, but I, I will work with the gentleman and, and agree to meet with the chairman and ranking member of ENC to see if we can't work out something before it comes to the floor, because I, I do want to make sure that this is a bill that is unanimously approved or nearly unanimously approved on the House floor, because I think it's that important. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, who seeks recognition? Gentleman from California. I move to strike the last word. I Gentleman's recognized. If I could ask Representative Isa another question. Normally, the Drug Enforcement Agency can add, delete, or change drugs on the schedules. If your bill became law, would the DEA, for example, two years from now, could they say, we're going to remove xylazine from Schedule 3? Uh, well, the gentleman would yield. Yes. I believe that, that if we give it to them, they can have temporary scheduling authority, uh, that that's where the move, add, and changes occur. Uh, and, uh, and that's, you know, they haven't asked for that. I don't believe they want that. Again, between now and the time it goes to the floor, I'm happy to ha also have an additional meeting with the administration because I believe that their support for this is going to be essential to make this a broadly uh, bipartisan vote on the House floor, and I want that. So uh, if the gentleman wants to have that along with the ranking member, uh, I'm certainly uh, would join in a request that the administration meet with us because I have no doubt that they want the authority this way. And if they don't, if they want a modification, I will work together to have that modification on the floor in a package. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Kentucky. Oh, gentleman from California. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm going to support the amendment because uh, it, it uh, takes us a small step away from uh, the, the, uh, what I see is, is, is a, a questionable policy. But I'm looking at the overall bill, and th this looks like every federal grant writer's wildest fantasy. 
Uh, I'm looking through the bill. I'm finding lavish increases in, quote, grants to address the problems of persons who experience violence-related stress, loan repayment program for the uh, substance part of the bill. Sorry, I forgot to silence my cell phone. But I, uh, lo loan repayment program for substances. That's a whip team calling him. <laughs> Getting back to the point, um, you've got a loan repayment program for substance uh, use disorder treatment workforce, pilot program for uh, public health laboratories, treatment recovery and workforce support grants, a grant program for state and tribal response for opioid use disorders, grant programs for opioid reversal agents, grant programs to address other concurrent substance use disorders, not to mention funding studies for, for everything even remotely related to the subject. Um, to me, this looks like a, a poster child of how to throw money at a problem with nothing to show for it at the end. I'm, I'm reminded of that uh, scene from uh, Ghostbusters uh, where they're informed they've lost their government grant and might have to go into the private sector. The private sector shrieks one of them. I've been in the private sector. They expect results. There are no results demanded in these grants, loan forgiveness programs, studies, and task forces. Well, what I've observed with these grant programs uh, over the years is, is there's no follow-up, no oversight, nothing to show for it in the end when all said and done. These, these grants ultimately disappear into the salaries of the grantees so they can write glowing reports about their plans uh, to, to justify even bigger grants in the next cycle. They get buried and forgotten in the federal bureaucracy, which keeps churning out money for them, like, like the magical salt mine of lore, until it ultimately sinks the ship. If the federal government needs something it can't produce itself, we ought to send out an RFP and then reward an enforceable contract to the lowest responsible bidder and not throw money at every direction and hope something good comes of it. And of course, we throw lots of new money, other people's money, at the problem to show that we care. Well, I, I can't support the bill for this, this, this reason. Uh, I would ask anyone, before we plus up and extend all of these grant programs and studies, uh, can anyone tell me any good that they've done so far? Uh, if the gentleman would yield. I'm done. Uh, if the gentleman, by that, is, is yielding briefly. Uh, this may be where the late Henry Hyde made his point, none of this is within our jurisdiction uh, of this committee, but I share with the gentleman that, that, like many, there is some flowery language that may end up costing a lot. I would suggest that, that that's something we should debate uh, in the rules for the floor. I would also su suggest that it is subject to appropriations, and uh, that's something that I know the gentleman and I will be working tirelessly throughout October on. Well, to take back the time I've already yielded, uh, I, I'd simply point out I have never found them shy about spending money once it's in an authorization. And would, would again, you, the question recurs, what good have we gotten from these programs to date if we're going to throw even more money at them next year? Would the gentleman yield? Sure. I just want to point out that I'm very glad that on this amendment and the, on this bill, uh, the gentleman and I have found something we agree on. And we even resorted to citations from Ghostbusters in the process. <laughs> who seeks recognition? And who says that the uh, judiciary? Who says that the judiciary committee is not an interesting place to be? We're um, trying. The gentlelady's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, xylazine is a growing concern in the West Coast, and particularly in the Puget Sound region where where I am. And so I really appreciate this discussion. I think it's a very important discussion. Um, you know, I think that the 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 reality is that. These issues do require money. They do require resources, and the Support Act um, includes several provisions that do improve public health and safety across the country, including necessary funding for substance abuse and specifically for opioid use disorder programs, which we all are dealing with in our, in our districts. Um, I really appreciate this amendment from Ranking Member Nadler because I think it addresses the concern that I have um, permanently scheduling xylazine does not account for the fact that many people that are currently being impacted by the drug are not taking it knowingly. It is being added to opioids. And so a temporary scheduling process, I think, would allow Congress and the administration time to develop a plan 
that addresses the supply and the healthcare concerns posed by xylazine, and also to address the unintended consequences that I know some people are concerned about who are dealing with fentanyl right now, which is that if we permanently schedule it, we don't want resources to be taken away from the core crisis of fentanyl, which is still the core crisis that we're dealing with. And so um, I think that this is, uh, this is a very important amendment in order for me to support the final pr bill. Um, I do think that scheduling the drug will also significantly impact veterinary medicine, especially a concern given that there isn't a significant diversion of xylazine from veterinary channels. Rather, people are getting it online. So um, I am uh, rising in support of Mr. Nadler's very sensible um, amendment, which I think would address the one area of concern that I do have in, in supporting this bill. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Who seeks recognition? I do. M Mr. Massey is recognized. So um, I have some constitutional concerns with this bill, as you might expect, and some federalism issues. But the constitutional infirmities aside, I want to talk about the practicality of this bill and some of the unintended consequences it might have. I raise cattle. Uh, I've never used a tran tranquilizer gun on one, but uh, I've had some pretty wild ones that I did want to use one of these guns on. Uh, I solved that problem by treating them with trailer myosin. If you can catch the cow, you put it in a trailer and go sell it. That takes care of a lot of problems with cattle. But uh, my experience with these dart guns comes from being a county executive. And there's 3,000 counties in the United States, and they all have, you can't call them dog catchers anymore. That's not politically correct. You've got to call them animal control officer. And uh, most of these animal control officers have non-lethal means of, of capturing animals, and it's uh, the most humane way to do it. I'm, our animal control officer in the county that I uh, oversaw as county judge executive kept one of these dart guns in his car. I'm, I'm not sure what drugs were in it, but I know that xylazine is one of those drugs that is commonly used in these dart guns to immobilize animals. And um, there were some, you know, uh, guidelines for keeping these drugs. They were locked, you know, he kept them locked up. But I'm just wondering what effect this would have on the three, more than 3,000 animal control officers in, in the country, and if we, you know, Mr. Ivey mentioned PCPs were uh, animal tranquilizers. If we keep going after all of the tranquilizers and say you have to have a PhD or a doctor's uh, degree in order to use these things, then we're forgetting about a lot of other people that may need these for humane methods of capturing animals, whether it's, it could be wildlife control officers. I imagine we'd have these. Uh, there's some species that are farmed, like deer and bison, that aren't amenable uh, to normal control methods that these might be used on. And um, like I said, I've never used one of these dart guns, but just taking a wild guess, and I'm not gonna name any names, but I guess some of my neighbors who farm might have one of these guns sitting around just in case they uh, need to tranquilize an animal. They may have a few of these darts sitting around. Do they become a different level of, of criminal uh, if we pass this law, Mr. Issa? Like it, uh, my question was, if you've got a farmer who's, let's say, two hours away from the nearest vet and he keeps one of these dart guns and it has darts with xylazine in it and he's not licensed but nobody really cares and it's gone on for 20 years. Now, if the gentleman would yield. Yeah. These drugs can be prescribed and, and held locally. They, uh, and again, we're, you know, as you know, they're not looking for a dart, they're looking for trafficking, and that's, that's what this, this law is intended for. So I'm happy to make sure that uh, before this goes to the floor that the gentleman is comfortable that a vet may prescribe these for, for, for use as a tranquilizer uh, by the way, there are other, many other tranquilizers. Uh, xylazine is not the, the preferred one for that particular I, use. I imagine, I imagine almost any of those tranquilizers are, is open to abuse. Uh, you know, I, I think almost every drug that <laughs> has been tried as a tranquilizer first, you know, 
um, that we, we both have children. We know this. Yeah. So um, my, my question isn't can a can a veterinarian get these drugs after we pass this law? My question is, what about the farmer in a rural area that has one of these dart guns sitting around? It's it's not sanctioned. He doesn't have a license. He's got two or three darts in case the animal gets out on the highway, and he wants to take you know control of the situation. Does he go from being a misdemeanor of a state crime to being a, a federal felon offense? If the general would yield. I would yield. As long as he gets it through his vet, he's going to be fine. So uh, this, will, this particular drug will have to be gotten through a vet uh, uh, as a Schedule Three drug. It doesn't change that. It just simply isn't an uncontrolled drug you can buy in, in mass and have a bucket of. Reclaiming my time. Why can't we just let the states deal with that and, and determine who should be able to get these darts for animal use? If the gentleman further yield. I, look, I have no problem with your, your dart example. What I have a problem with is the bulk. We, right now, we cannot control the bulk purchase and distribution leading to it being mixed with fentanyl when in fact that is making fentanyl a more deadly and more addictive drug and that's the reason that we want to we want to control the Re substance. Reclaiming my time before it expires, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I just, you know, I want to say I do believe there are occasions where these darts are diverted and become drugs and sometimes that does happen. And um, I'm sure you would want to stop that from happening as well. My concern is, it's just federal overreach. This should be regulated by the state. You're gonna unintentionally impact 3,000 counties and 10,000 cities, animal control officers, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like more time to look at it, and I yield back. Gentleman's time is uh, expired. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like, to, like to ask unanimous consent that the amendment uh, offered by Mr. Nadler be changed in one and only one sense, which is to take the any place the year one year is there, that it be made three years. So this, the, pursuant to the gentleman's uh, amendment, we would agree to a three-year temporary status, uh, and then we'll work with the NC to make them love it. Mr. Chairman, uh, gentleman is recognized. Uh, I thank the gentleman for uh, working with us, and I agree with the uh, with the unanimous consent request. Then, without objection, the amendment is. Then I move the previous question, Mr. Chairman. The, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the, as amended by the gentleman from California. New York. New York, sorry, New York. Uh, those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. So the question is now on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be as amended. This will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting the bill. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of substitute is adopted. Requested vote. You wait for the final. We'll wait for the final. A reporting quorum being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. no. The, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The bill is or, or requested, uh, a uh, recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. None of us have had enough sleep, for the record. Mr. Issa. Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Buck. We Mr. Gates. I if I'd accepted it sooner, I'm afraid. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Yes. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz votes yes. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes aye. Mr. Van Drew. Yes. Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels. Yes. Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley. Aye. Mr. Kiley votes aye. Ms. Hageman. Yes. Ms. Hageman votes yes. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Aye. Mr. Fry votes aye. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. 
Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Co Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal? Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa? Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose? Ms. McBath? Ms. Dean? Ms. Escobar? Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? Aye. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant? Ms. Ballant votes aye. Mr. Gates, you are not recorded. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Chair, Mr. Jordan votes yes. Are there any members who still wish to vote? Then the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 29 ayes and three noes. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute, incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to follow Mr. up on Deborah Ross's suggestion. That went so well. Can you take up the CR now? <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman is way out of order. Uh, <laughs> Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 786 to amend Title 28 U.S. Code to provide an additional place for holding court for the Pecos Division of the Western District of Texas and for other purposes, for purposes of markup and move that the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 786 to amend Title 28. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this one is going to be even easier than the CR. Mm. Americans rely on the federal courts every day to protect their rights and obtain relief from those rights when they've been violated. This is an important, but thank goodness, simple and bipartisan bill that adds just two words, and the words and Alpine, to the United States Code to save thousands of Americans in West Texas upwards of 200 miles of driving round trip just to reach a federal courthouse. The bill adds uh, just two words, Mount Vernon, to dramatically reduce access to courts for Americans in Western Washington as well. Four words and thousands of fellow citizens will be able, better able to protect their rights and save an amazing amount of carbon. And both Alpine, Texas and Mount Vernon, Washington already have these facilities necessary to hold court. So the cost to, of this bill is minimal, but in fact, it is a net savings to America. Thank you for supporting this bipartisan bill. And with that, before I may get, lose any votes, I yield back. The uh, chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler. For no Thank you, Mr. Speech. Chairman, finding myself in rare agreement with Mr. Issa. Uh, Mr. Chairman, H.R. 786 would amend Title 28 of the U.S. Code to provide an additional place for holding court in the Western District of Texas and in the Western District of Washington. Both districts are composed of, of a comprised of wide areas of land. The Western District of Washington takes up half of Washington State, from the Cascade Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. Similarly, the Western District of Texas covers the western 68 counties of the state, encompassing 93,000 square miles. More importantly, a total of approximately 12.2 million people call these two districts home. On paper, our basic rights do not change depending where we live. Yet in practice, that is exactly what is happening. Residents of these two districts sometimes need to drive for hours to attend court. It makes no sense that just because someone lives in, more, in a more rural, wider district, 
They should incur dramatically increased travel time and administrative costs to seek justice. Adding courthouses is a small step in the right direction towards making the courthouse doors accessible to all Americans no matter where they live. An easy way to alleviate the burdens on the res residents of the Western Districts of Washington and Texas would be to add a courthouse. It would also be a cost-free change because there is an existing facility available for the court to use and no, person, no court personnel would be permanently stationed there. Making use of this existing facility would ensure that litigants, attorneys, witnesses, and other court users would have greater access to the justice that our federal courts provide. The Judicial Conference has recommended the addition of these two courthouses, a recommendation that grew even more urgent after the Western District of Washington's Bellingham facility had part of its roof collapse. This country cannot have a flourishing justice system when its buildings are falling apart, its staff are underpaid, and there is a perpetual shortage of judges to fairly administer the laws. This bill will not fix all of these problems. I hope we'll, Mr. Mr. Issa and I are sponsoring legislation to add more judges. But it will take a small step to help 12.2 million Americans gain equal access to justice, and I think it is a step worth taking. I thank Representatives Tony Gonzalez, Rick Larson, and Susan Del Beni for calling attention to this issue and for working on a bipartisan basis to introduce this legislation to improve the lives of the residents of Texas and Washington. I urge my colleagues to support the bill, and I yield back, and I yield back the balance of my time. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. Does anyone seek recognition? The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer an amendment to the bill. Uh, gentleman, present his amendment. I, I thank the Chairman. Corporal Reed. Amendment to HR 786 offered by Mr. Nagus of Colorado. Add at the end of the bill the following. District of Colorado, Section 85 of Title 28, United States Code, is amended by inserting after Durango the following Fort Collins. Uh, Chairman, I reserve a point the, of order. Gentleman reserves a point of order. Uh, gentleman is recognized. Speak on the amendment. I thank the chairman. Uh, just by way of background, as you all know, I represent the state of Colorado. There are currently five federal courthouses in Colorado, including two in Denver, one in Colorado Springs, one in Grand Junction, and one in Durango. Now, for those who are less familiar with Colorado geography, that means there are currently no federal courthouses for, court, uh, for Coloradans who live in the eastern part of our state, which, of course, is represented by my good friend, Mr. Buck, uh, and in northern Colorado, uh, which uh, happens to be the area that I call home and am proud to represent. The closest federal courthouse for many of my constituents uh, is upwards of three hours away uh, without traffic in good uh, road conditions, which, as you might imagine, can be difficult uh, at times in Colorado. Fort Collins, a city that I represent, is the fourth largest city in Colorado. It's located in the northern part of the state. Now, this amendment does something very simple. It simply adds Fort Collins as a place, an additional location in which uh, court proceedings can be held, which, uh, in my view, uh, would provide access, better access to justice for many Coloradans in that part of our state and the district that I have the privilege of representing. Now, I recognize, uh, I know this has been a delicately negotiated uh, bill, and uh, I certainly do not want to uh, impede in that regard and, and, and have respect for my colleague from California and, and support his bill. And so I will withdraw this amendment, but I thought it was important for the record uh, to, to bring it forward and to underscore that there are many members of this committee, and I happen to be one of them, who have been pushing for similar legislation in the past. And I would hope uh, that my colleagues would be as supportive uh, as we are of his efforts. And perhaps there's a Republican colleague on the other side of the aisle here who uh, happens to have a similar need, perhaps, in the state of Virginia or any of the other states represented here as I look uh, across California, of course, to the chairman, uh, you would have a willing partner in me to develop similar legislation to try to get that across the finish line. So uh, I will withdraw the amendment. Thank Without you. Mr. Objection, chairman, the amendment is withdrawn. Mr. Issa. In order to close this out, I want to make sure that the gentleman understands, as long as we can get judicial conference uh, for consultation, I would be glad to be your co-sponsor uh, on, on a similar package, uh, which I'm happy to work on immediately. But today we're opening the floodgates for consideration of other areas, and I'll be happy to work on yours as a, uh, an avid visitor of your state. I thank the, I thank the gentleman.
Is there further discussion on the bill? Seeing none, a reporting quorum being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two legislative days to submit views. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 5721, the Rape Kit Backlog Progress Act of 2023 for purposes of markup and move that the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 5721 to amend Without the Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Lee, for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, there's an amendment at the desk. Opening clerk. statement. No? O opening statement. Opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The bill we are here to discuss today is the Rape Kit Backlog Act of 2023. This is a critically important issue as our committee continues to work for justice for victims of these terrible crimes. There are as many as 100,000 untested rape kits sitting on shelves in law enforcement buildings and DNA labs across the country. Untested rape kits mean no accountability for the predators who are responsible for these violent sex offenses. To make matters worse, these criminals often have lengthy criminal histories. Approximately 70 out of every 1,000 suspected rapists will be arrested for committing another crime before their case is decided. We cannot allow these predators to roam free because a kit has not yet been processed. The Rape Kit Backlog Act of 2023 will improve reporting requirements for state and local governments and provide greater visibility into testing backlogs across the country. It will also allow greater transparency by ensuring that states develop an electronic tracking system so that victims may monitor the status of their kit and therefore the status of their case. Victims deserve to know whether their kit is being tested or whether it is caught in a backlog. And if the backlog continues to persist, states should be held accountable for failing to serve and protect those who live there. Let's take this important step and pass the Rape Kit Backlog Act out of committee and onto the floor for a vote. Thank you, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for an opening statement. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 5721, the Rape Kit Backlog Progress Act of 2023, would impose a new reporting requirement on state and local governments that receive funding from the Byrne JAG program with the goal of providing a clear understanding of the National Rape Kit Backlog and the steps that localities are taking to address it. While the backlog of untested rape kits is a pressing issue that cannot be overlooked, it is essential that we also have transparency and accountability in how federal funds and how federal grant funds are being utilized to tackle this problem and to ensure vic uh, justice for victims and survivors. Congress has created several grant programs that address rape kit availability and analysis and the rape kit backlog. Most of these programs focus on assisting state and local law enforcement and crime labs to address their backlogs or to find research about the backlog. These grant programs include the Sexual Assault Forensic Exam Program, the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, and the largest of the grant programs, the Debbie Smith DNA Backlog Grant Program, as well as several grants authorized in the Violence Against Women Act. The rape kit backlog represents a profound failure of our criminal justice system an injustice that leaves survivors of sexual assault without the closure they deserve. These kits contain crucial DNA evidence that can identify perpetrators, connect unsolved cases, prevent further victimization, and exonerate the wrongfully convicted. Yet numerous studies and reports indicate that thousands of these kits remain untested. However, the exact number of untested kits is unknown, since many jurisdictions do not have systems for counting or tracking rape kits and there's no federal law mandating the tracking or testing of rape kits, nor a federal reporting requirement of any kind. While the federal government has recognized the urgency of addressing this backlog and has dispersed millions of dollars in grant funding, it is vital that we understand the nature and extent of the problem and why it persists. Accountability and transparency are essential to ensure that these funds are being put to their intended use, including the expeditious processing and analysis of rape kits and other DNA evidence, the establishment and use of an inventory system for tracking rape kits and informing victims of the status of their, kit, of their kits. By requiring this information and the additional elements outlined in the bill, 
Congress can make informed decisions on how and where to allocate resources in the future and to better meet the needs of local and state agencies working to reduce their backlogs. I understand that various stakeholder groups have raised concerns with, very, with certain aspects of this legislation. They have a point. These issues have not been fully vetted since this legislation has neither had a hearing nor sufficient notice before markup to work through these concerns. Despite these deficiencies, I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 5721, as it is critical that we have transparency, accountability, and a clear understanding of the rape kit backlog, as well as the progress being made to reduce it. And I hope that we can work together to further improve the bill. I now uh, yield a minute to uh, uh, Gentlelady from California, uh, uh, Ms. Lofgren. Th thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Uh, Ranking Member. We passed an, into law a number of years ago the Rape Survivors Bill of Rights, which prevents the destruction of rape kits, but this, I think, helps uh, provide transparency. I'll just say my county has now caught up on all of the testing there within uh, six months. This is a question of whether you want to do it or not. And I think the transparency that this will provide will be very helpful. Um, there's no reason why this crime um, solving uh, action can't be taken in every county in the United States. So I, I thank uh, you for your comments. I, I support this bill, uh, especially since it follows up on the Rape Survivors Bill of Rights uh, passed into law. Uh, some years ago. And with that, I yield back and thank you for letting me uh, speak. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back without objection. All of their opening statements will be included in the record. Uh, the chair, oh, Mr. Correa, for what purpose do you rise? Move the strike. Uh, we're going to, okay, the gentleman's recognized. The gentleman's recognized. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to concur and support this legislation. Lifetime ago, when I served in the California State Senate, I was able to do a lot of work with DNA as a, as a tool to solve sex crimes. And what you find out is that rape is a heinous crime, and the vast majority of the victims yes. never step up to report this heinous crime. And those that are reported, those victims have to bear a criminal justice system that humiliates them and essentially causes them to essentially back off and rethink their decision to step forward. The average rapist attacks an average of seven to eight times before that perpetrator is actually caught. DNA is a very powerful tool, but it's only as powerful as the databases that we have and the connectivity of those databases on a statewide basis. In my county back home in Orange County, you remember numerous cases where the perpetrators, when we analyzed their DNA data, were actually in another state. Connecting all that data together clearly is a step in the right direction when it comes to bringing these animals, these perpetrators to justice. Anything we can do, everything we can do to make sure that DNA, the victims, of these heinous crimes that brought to justice is a step in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there further discussion? The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Oh, I'm sorry. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Lee of Virginia. No. Oh. Florida. Florida. For the purpose of offering. For the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5721- Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered base text for the purposes of amendment. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment makes a small grammatical change and does nothing to alter the substance of the bill. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. So further discussion, Ms. Jackson, Lee of Texas. I thank the gentleman. This committee has done um, a uh, enormous amount of work dealing with rape kit backlogs and have really made progress along with our Senate colleagues on the issue of backlog. However, any addition that will help uh, expand uh, and improve uh, the uh, rape kit backlog that exists across the nation should be welcomed. Uh, as I understand the legislation of Ms. Mace of North Carolina, uh, this uh, particular legislation 
is going to require reporting requirements to provide greater insight into the national rape kit backlog. For more than 20 years, Congress has provided millions in federal funding through various grant programs, including the Debbie Smith Act and the Violence Against Women Act, um, to reduce the number of untested rape kits and DNA samples in evidence rooms and crime labs. They still exist. Backlog remains, and there are several studies and countless reports that attempt to provide an estimate of the magnitude of the problem as it exists today. Some claim that there are approximately 100,000 untested kits in America, while others claim that there are at least 400,000 untested kits. Uh, I support this legislation because after two decades, it's necessary to determine what contributes to that so that we can improve um, the response uh, in terms of efficiency of testing analysis. Rather than the words that are on my paper, um, I want to emphasize these are people's lives. Rape uh, and its um, additional aspects of assault, violence, really changes and impacts people's lives. Tragically, some people, women, don't live. And so uh, it is clearly an important aspect uh, that we find out the whys. But I am aware that several stakeholder groups with varying interests have voiced concerns with certain provisions in this bill. However, as many of my Republican colleagues have asserted in the past, accountability and transparency are vital to the allocation expenditure of taxpayer funding. And I want to work with those stakeholders to make sure that we are moving in the right direction. The entities that receive millions of dollars in grants should uh, be able to respond to how those grants are being used efficiently. I will just conclude by saying these are people's lives. These are women's lives. These are actions, criminal actions, that are devastating, life-changing. Uh, and if we can add one small measure of reporting to determine what uh, our next steps should be, I think we should do so. I will have an amendment accordingly, uh, and uh, I would hope uh, that we would move on the amendment. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back. Is there further discussion? Should I recognize Mr. Schiff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When a sexual assault occurring, uh, excuse me, with a sexual assault occurring about once per minute in this country, it's imperative that people have access to justice that is swift and sure. However, rape kit backlogs are, are pervasive in jurisdictions throughout the United States. When a rape kit is collected, victims of sexual assault rightfully expect that kit to be tested for DNA. DNA is a crucial tool for law enforcement and prosecutors when seeking to get violent actors off the street. But thousands upon thousands of rape kits sit on shelves in the basements of police stations or labs collecting dust, and sometimes for years. We cannot tell survivors they should report to the police and then let the evidence of their assault or rape simply languish. I fought to end this epidemic uh, problem, this endemic problem, during my time in Congress when I discovered uh, a decade ago that in Los Angeles County uh, there were thousands of rape kits uh, sitting uh, untested uh, at LAPD and the LA Sheriff's Office. I worked hard to bring millions in funding back to Los Angeles uh, to reduce and eliminate those backlogs. I've also been proud to help secure funding for the establishment of the Verdugo Regional Crime Lab, as well as subsequent funding through the DNA Capacity Enhancement and Backlog Reduction Program to tackle this problem. The importance of the work uh, that they do uh, in my community cannot be overstated. They're capable of processing 400 to 600 DNA samples each month from sexual assaults, burglaries, and other crimes. But the rape kit backlog problem persists around the country. Uh, the backlog, the Rape Kit Backlog Progress Act would help improve reporting requirements, increase transparency, uh, which is critical to making progress on ending uh, this terrible backlog. I thank the sponsors of the legislation for the work on the issue and urge my colleagues to join me in voting yes on the underlying bill. And with that, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much to the sponsors of this bill. I'm a proud co-sponsor as well. Far too many Americans are victims of sexual assault and rape. The Rape Kit Backlog Progress Act of 2023 is an important and overdue piece of legislation that will help get criminals off our streets and bring closure to survivors across the United States. 
Since their inception in the mid-1970s, sexual assault examination kits have proved to be an invaluable resource to law enforcement, allowing for the collection of evidence after an individual reports that they have been sexually assaulted or raped. Due in part to limited resources, the number of untested kits has grown exponentially, sometimes sitting untouched on shelves in police departments and laboratories for decades. Fortunately, in recent years, many states have begun to allocate their own funds to help clearing the backlog. In 2019, around 16,000 untested sexual assault kits were identified in my home state of North Carolina. Attorney General Josh Stein has worked diligently with law enforcement across the state to test these kits at, that have been on shelves for years. Since the testing began, A.G. Stein and the North Carolina Department of Justice have made 86 arrests and counting. Thanks to the FBI's combined DNA index system, other kits in North Carolina have been cross-referenced with this database, and a combined 156 arrests have been made. Many of the perpetrators were found to have committed the same crime multiple times. In addition, and importantly, some individuals have been exonerated after being incarcerated for crimes they did not commit. And North Carolina has a DNA innocence law that allows that evidence to come forward even after conviction. This bill will ensure that other states do as North Carolina has done and undertake an audit of the number of kits in their possession awaiting testing. As I said, I'm a proud co-sponsor of this bill, and I urge my colleagues' support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Scanlon. <coughs> I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Hundreds of thousands of rape kits are currently sitting untested in police departments and crime lab storage facilities around the country, <coughs> and that's simply unacceptable. DNA evidence is a powerful tool that supports law enforcement's ability to solve crimes and prevents offenders from harming other people. It also helps survivors achieve the justice they deserve. In recent years, our leadership in Pennsylvania has undertaken serious work to clean up the backlog of thousands and, in some cases, uh, decades of untested rape kits. Under our former Attorney General, Josh Shapiro, we saw the backlog for the entire state of Pennsylvania through the state police cleared. And in Philadelphia, we saw a 1,500 uh, test kit backlog cleared over the last few years. And that data allowed the prosecution of dozens of additional um, offenders. So this progress has been incredibly impactful, but we need to keep it up. And other states have backlogs of their own to address. We've heard from several members that the vagaries of funding and leadership can be an impediment to getting this work done. So uh, I'm really pleased that this bipartisan bill would add critical accountability um, to clear the backlogs, to solve crimes, and deliver justice. So I look forward to voting this bill out of committee today and hope all of our colleagues will do the same. I yield back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Scanlon. Oh, member, sorry, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, like. Mr. Schiff and others, I've worked on this issue for a long time. I'm a co-sponsor of this bill, and I appreciate it being brought, and I commend this prime sponsor. We had a tragic situation in Memphis that shows the need for this bill and the reporting requirements. Last year, in early September, there was a young lady who was jogging, and she was abducted, kidnapped, and murdered. It made the national news for four consecutive days. It was an event that turned Memphis on its heels and made people realize that crime is so potentially, a, everybody's potentially a victim, but it was a young woman who had done so much to help others and she's just killed. It was later found out about three weeks later, two or three weeks later, that the gentleman, I shouldn't say gentleman, the individual who kidnapped and murdered her had been accused of assaulting and sexually assaulting and raping a woman 11 months earlier. 
the rape kit result did not get back to the police from the state rape kit group until after the lady in Memphis had been kidnapped and murdered. It took 11 and a half months for that kit to come back, and it showed that the same man who committed the murder and kidnapping had committed the rape of this woman. The man had been in jail for 18 years, having kidnapped an individual in Memphis and had been out of jail for only about a year. That young lady would not have been raped would not have been kidnapped and murdered, but for the failure of the state to have a sufficient number of individuals employed at the rape program, kit program in Tennessee to allow th that kit to be studied, analyzed, and the result being been known. So this is important. We need to keep reviews over these departments, make sure they're doing their job. Getting money is not sufficient. We've got to stand heard on them. So thank you. Let's pass the bill. Let's get it done. I yield back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Ballant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Sexual assault survivors across this country, my constituents, your constituents, assume, you know, of course they do, they assume that their rape kits will be tested. They take this really intrusive and very traumatic step because they believe that the evidence will be tested, it will be examined, and then used as evidence. The public also believes this, and yet this is not the case. So estimates are that hundreds of thousands of rape kits across the country sit on shelves untested. And my, my message this morning is simple. We need to take this important step to right this outrageous wrong. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Further discussion, Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend <laughs> the gentlelady for um, this amendment uh, and the language uh, that she brings forth. As I read this, um, there is a reporting requirement to the extent that uh, a jurisdiction fails to meet that reporting requirement, which is to generate a report in a year, then that state or unit of local government shall become ineligible for a grant under the subpart. And I, I agree with that, I think that's fine. But I, I do wanna flag this for the committee. Uh, so when we get the report a year from now, <clears throat> we're gonna have a lot of jurisdictions that have failed to um, get up to speed on the testing requirement. And I, I wanna say this now, I think we have to come up with penalties that um, or some sort of trigger that requires them to get that done. I'm not necessarily willing to go to the point of we're gonna terminate all grants for those jurisdictions. But I, you know, depending on how, how bad the problem is when we get the report back, we might need to do that. Because frankly, you know, I've been hearing about this for decades now. We've been trying to get these test kits done. When I was a, a local prosecutor, I was elected in in Maryland for two terms, and we were just sort of getting these um, test kits and the DNA systems were coming up, and we had we saw two tracks. Um, one was the, the conviction rates, because uh, it's very powerful when you get the DNA evidence. Um, and as has been said by others this morning, um, you know, frequently someone who's been an offender in another case become, has an offender uh, in the pending case, uh, and having that information for that trial is important for sure. It helps to make it more likely you'll get a conviction. But also, as we've been saying this morning, it also preempts the possibility of that second rape occurring if you know at the time the first rape occurs uh, that you've got DNA evidence and you can use that for prosecution at the time. Uh, and then the other thing I saw too, um, in many instances when I was a prosecutor was people were cleared during the investigation stage uh, of a rape. And so I had several cases, and we were discussing this offline uh, previously, where we thought we had the right person. You know, he'd been arrested, he you know, met the description, everything lined up from a traditional investigative standpoint. Then the DNA results come back and you've got the wrong guy. So I think it's critical for us to get this done. And as Ms. Ballant was just saying a moment ago, um, Essentially, law enforcement makes a promise to these survivors when we put them through this uh, intrusive process. Um, 
and to the extent some of them have gone through a trial even, uh, and you know you have the scenario where someone potentially was wrongfully convicted, that victim's gonna have to go through another process again, potentially, and deal with uh, being re-traumatized again. So I think it's critical for us to move forward. I, again, thank the gentlelady for, for this language, but we need to make sure we are willing to take the steps when we get the report back, because you know, I'll bet dollars to donuts on what it's gonna say. We're gonna have jurisdictions out there that are gonna be way behind on testing kits, and they will have been way behind for decades, maybe even some in Maryland, so I might get in trouble with some of my local constituents. But we need to get this going, and we need to move it forward, and we have to do that by showing we're serious, and sometimes that includes penalties and sanctions to move local and state governments forward. And with that, I yield back. General Lewis back, is there any further discussion? I have an amendment at the desk. I recognize the general lady from Texas. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. General reserves a point of order. I have an amendment order. at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 5721 offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of substitute be considered as read and should be considered the base text for purposes of amendment. Oh, hold Sorry, on. The amendment will Sorry, the Sorry. amendment we consider is read. The general lady is recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think we have heard um, every member on this committee join in in their complete support for the cruciality of legislation that would determine why across the landscape of America there are backlogs. And we have even had devastating uh, recounting of the loss of life because the DNA um, rape kit was not returned. As you well know, this work has been done through this committee, and I have been certainly focused on this work, the Debbie Smith Act, but we worked very hard on the Violence Against Women Act that in particular uh, would be impacting all across the nation, Houston, had a challenge, Texas had a challenge, and I was specifically concerned with the Violence Against Women Act in my own home generation, in my own uh, jurisdiction, uh, which would include the local lab that faced uh, these insurmountable challenges. So the Judiciary Committee is on record for abhorring the slowness in some areas that have cost lives and of course innocent women in particular, to be assaulted violently because violent criminals have not been taken off the streets because we have failed to process the DNA on the rape kit. So uh, I have a great respect for the gentlewoman from North Carolina, but it does not mean that we should not do our job. So we have heard of the uh, concerns by certain stakeholders, which by the way, include police officers who are concerned. And so as HR 521, 5721 is currently written, failure to comply with the new reporting requirements outlined in this bill would render any state or local government ineligible to apply for the heart and soul of those corrective grants, the Burn JAG grant funds. Uh, I wanna put a hammer down. We want those reporting requirements to be in but our states are big and small. The JAG grants are their lifeline for fighting crime. And any state or local government that has received burn JAG funds that, but fails to meet these new reporting requirements within one year of enactment would render any such entity totally ineligible for a burn grant. That's your small towns, your hamlets, your villages, your cities. This penalty could have a devastating impact on many states and local governments. So my amendment would make ineligibility for Debbie Smith grants, the penalty for failure to meet the reporting requirements detailed in HR 5721, 
Those are important grants, as these additional conditions for eligibility are directly linked to the goals and purposes of the Debbie Smith Backlog Grant Program. The additional provision of this bill will also be inserted into the appropriate statutory sections as indicated. My amendment simply says, don't kill the lifeline of police departments across America. You end their burn grants, here's what you will end. Programs necessary to support law enforcement, prosecution in courts, prevention and education, corrections and community corrections, drug treatment and enforcement, planning, evaluation, technology improvement, crime victim and witness initiatives, mental health programs, and related law enforcement and correction programs, and implementation of state crisis intervention, court proceedings, and related programs or initiatives. This should be conveyed to the author of this legislation. I would think that she would have absolutely uh, no uh, concern uh, in engaging on this very point because her intent is an excellent intent and that is to get us focused on the backlog. But when you take and eliminate the burn grants, you are literally shutting down law enforcement in every single state and hamlet and county and city. And I think of Houston, I think of Harris County, and I think of them not having access to lifeline grants in protecting the community. And let me be clear that I love the Carolinas, but Representative Mace is from South Carolina. I had her in another beautiful state of Carolina, but she is from South Carolina, and I welcome her work. For that, Mr. Chairman, um, I um, yield back uh, with the passion that this can be made better. We can work together, but you are cutting off the lifeline of our friends in law enforcement on those burn grants. The gentle lady yields back. Is there further discussion? Does the gentleman withdraw his point of order? Point of order is withdrawn. Is there further discussion? Well, turned it off. Miss Lee as well. Um, I think we can uh, find a common ground. We are all passionate about this. Uh, legislation. Uh, if you look at the details of it, you'll see that the cut into the burn grants really impact other law enforcement uh, work. And so with that, um, hopefully, a commitment, Ms. Lee, I don't know, um, I know that you are, I know it's Ms. Mace, but um, hopefully we can all work together. I will withdraw the amendment at this time. Without Ask unanimous consent to withdraw the amendment. Without objection, time. the amendment is withdrawn. Is there a further discussion on the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Seeing none, the question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting the bill. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of substitute is adopted. The reporting requirement being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Uh, mem Gentlemen, uh, ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana, Mr. Biggs, Mr. McClintock, Mr. McClintock votes aye, Mr. Tiffany, Mr. Tiffany votes aye, Mr. Massey, Mr. Roy, Mr. Bishop, Ms. Sparts, Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz, Mr. Bentz votes yes. Mr. Klein, Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden, Mr. Gooden votes aye. Mr. Van Drew, Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kiley, Mr. Kiley votes aye. 
Ms. Hageman. Aye. Ms. Hageman votes aye. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes aye. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Ms. Ballant votes aye. Mr. Nels. Yes. Mr. Nels votes yes. Are there any other members that uh, wish to vote? Mr. Fry, you're not recorded. Mr. Fry votes yes. Are there any other members who wish to vote? Seeing none, the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 26 ayes and zero noes. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Uh, without objection, the bill reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Uh, pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 1105, the Debbie Smith Act of 2023, for purposes of markup, and move that the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 1105 to amend the Without Dean. objection, the uh, bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hunt, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are pleased to have the Debbie Smith Act of 2023 before our committee today. Debbie Smith's, tragic, uh, De Debbie Smith's story is tragic and sadly when that happens all too often in our country. In 1989, Debbie Smith was sexually assaulted by a stranger who broke into her home. Although she underwent an exam, the DNA evidence went unanalyzed for five years. Eventually, the evidence was entered into the FBI's national database. A suspect was found and brought to justice, but justice took far too long. You may remember the story of Eliza Fletcher, a young mother of two and kindergarten teacher from Memphis who was abducted, was abducted and murdered while out on a morning jog. But her killer should have never been on the streets in the first place. He should have been in jail for raping another woman in a prior year. He wasn't in jail though, because the rape kit that tied him to the crime was never processed. These stories must stop. Women are worth protecting. As a father of two daughters, I take this very seriously, and I'm sure I have many colleagues, if not all of my colleagues, on both sides of the aisle that feel the exact same way. There are as many as 100,000 untested rape kits sitting on the shelves in law enforcement buildings and DNA labs across this nation. Because of this, how many rapists still remain at large in this country? We have the tools to catch them, not just the resources. And as a country, we have to do everything in our power to protect women against violence. We all know the phrase, justice delayed is justice denied. But in the case of rape kit backlogs, justice delayed emboldens criminals and endangers women. We can't let criminals roam the streets because of a delay in processing rape kits. We must protect women. We must reauthorize the Debbie Smith Act. Congress passed the Debbie Smith Act in 2004 and reauthorized it in 2008, 2014, and 2019 to support public crime laboratories' work to build capacity and process DNA evidence, including evidence collected in rape kits. We look forward to passing this legislation again and helping secure justice for victims of these heinous crimes. Thank you, with that I yield back. Gentlemen, who's back, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for an opening statement. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 1105, the Debbie Smith Act of 2023, would re reauthorize landmark legislation first enacted in 2004, which has been instrumental in addressing the backlog of untested rape kits sitting in evidence rooms and crime labs across the country. Nearly 20 years ago, when I helped lead efforts to enact the original version of this legislation, I said, quote, it is imperative that we eliminate the shameful backlog of untested rape kits, unquote. Despite our best efforts, the backlog still exists, and my thoughts remain the same. It is imperative that we eliminate the rape kit backlog, full stop. For every rape kit that is yet to be tested, there is a victim of an unspeakable crime who has yet to see justice or find closure. And in some cases, there is an individual languishing in prison who does not belong there. It is for these reasons that we must continue the crucial mission of this legislation and ensure justice for survivors and for the wrongfully convicted. Over the past two decades, the De Debbie Smith Act has been vital in supporting the processing and analysis of rape kits, DNA collection and analysis, and victim resources. Millions of dollars have been allocated to increase the capacity of forensic laboratories in countless jurisdictions, provide DNA training and education to thousands of law enforcement personnel, and provide support services to a multitude of victims. As a result of this legislation, thousands of cases have been solved, and countless survivors have finally received the justice they so rightly deserve. While we laud the numerous achievements made possible by this legislation, ultimately we know that funding is vital to the success of this grant program. That is why I offered an amendment to similar legislation during the 107th Congress that would increase the authorization of funds to address the backlog to $150 million. Although the Debbie Smith Act was authorized to provide up to $151 million in grant funds during the following Congress, the full amount has never been appropriated, and it appears that the amounts appropriated are decreasing each year. Failure to fully fund this program limits the capacity to address the backlog, which often numbers in the thousands and has worsened largely due to the pandemic. Delays in testing undermine public safety, allowing dangerous criminals to evade apprehension and potentially commit additional crimes. That is why I hope that the appropriators will fully fund this program go going forward. Reauthorizing the Debbie Smith Act makes our communities safer. By investing in DNA testing and forensic technology, we empower law enforcement agencies to identify perpetrators more efficiently and to link them to other unsolved cases. This not only brings closure to victims and their families, but it also prevents future crimes by removing serial offenders from our streets. Reauthorizing the Debbie Smith Act also sends a clear message to survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and other crimes that we stand with them. The Debbie Smith Act has proven to be a bipartisan beacon of hope, shining a light on justice, sometimes long denied. I support H.R. 1105, which reauthorizes this crucial legislation and emphasizes our commitment not only to public safety, but also to survivor support and crime prevention. I urge my colleagues, both Republican and Democrat, to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back without objection. All other statements will be included in the record. Is there any discussion on the motion? Mr. Jackson, Ms. Jackson Lee. I'd like to strike the last word. General lady is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I strongly support H.R. 1105, the Debbie Smith Act of 2023. Having served on this committee now for more than 20 years, um, I'm reminded of the tragic journey that we have taken, uh, or had to take, uh, when uh, these legislative initiatives were not in place and the negative impact across the nation, but more importantly, on women victims, victims of rape, which includes children, that would reauthorize this bill, uh, presently would reauthorize critical grant funding aimed at ending the rape kit backlog. I'm proud to be one of four original co-sponsors of this bipartisan legislation, and I'm proud to stand with Ranking Member Steve Cohen and Representative Wesley Hunt. And I'm encouraged by the number of co-sponsors, Republicans and Democrats, who have joined us, including Ranking Member Nadler, Chairman Biggs, and many other members of this committee. Um, we must find a level of which there is absolutely no backlog, that these cases are treated such that we are fighting crime in the immediate time and saving lives. H.R. 1105 reauthorizes legislation that provides resources 
state and local enforcement agencies and prosecutors to reduce the national backlog of DNA evidence, most notably rape kits. Although DNA evidence has proven critical to solving crimes and delivering justice, particularly in crimes of sexual violence, there is still challenges to holding offenders accountable using such uh, evidence. Research has shown that testing backlog kits can lead to combined DNA index system hits as well as arrests and convictions. One study of 491 untested kits in the possession of the Houston Police Department yielded 104 CODIS hits after testing, and 16 of those hits led to arrests. Just one, just one can save lives of future victims, potential victims of rape, and certainly bring conviction to those, unfortunately, that have fallen victim to the heinous crime of rape, violent, devastating, and sometimes resulting in loss of life. Debbie Smith grants have helped reduce the backlog in, jurisdiction, in jurisdictions in every corner of the country. For instance, the New York Times reported that my home state of Texas had a backlog of approximately 20,000 untested kits in 2013, and according to a report by the Dallas Morning News, that number was reduced to just over 6,000 by 2021. Yes, we want to be down to zero. Unfortunately, a measure of the progress made in reducing the national backlog was lost due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, recognizing the accomplishments made since the Debbie Smith Act first became law, I'm confident, I'm very confident that we will once again reduce the number of untested samples and rape kits and eventually in the backlog, but more importantly, bring these violent criminals to justice. It is now up to Congress to make certain that every victim and every survivor experiences the relief she felt knowing that her rapist could no longer harm her, her loved ones, or her community. That is why I will do all that I can to ensure that every rape kit is tested and every sample is analyzed so that no survivor's voice is silenced, and no victim's cry for justice goes unanswered, no family continues to be mourned or continues to mourn because of loss of life of their loved ones, and no criminal goes free because of a failure to act. This is a heinous act that will always be remembered by the victim that lives, and so we must find a solution. That includes supporting this bill and encouraging my colleagues to do the same. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Klein. I move to strike the last word. The general is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to associate myself with the comments from the general lady from Texas uh, in support of this important legislation. Uh, the rape kit backlog is a significant impediment to prosecuting perpetrators of sexual assault. DNA evidence gathered from rape kits is often critical for bringing perpetrators of sexual assault to justice. Congress passed the Debbie Smith Act in 2004 and reauthorized it in 2008, 2014, and 2019 to support public crime laboratories' work to build capacity and process DNA evidence, including evidence collected in rape kits. As a former prosecutor, I know all too well how critical evidence is to achieving justice for the victims of sexual assault. I'm proud to be one of the original co-sponsors of this effort to reauthorize the Debbie Smith Act, ensuring that our law enforcement agencies will once again have the support and resources that they need to reduce unacceptable DNA backlogs and hold violent predators accountable for their crimes. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Dean. Move to strike the last word. Well, these recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of H.R. 1105, the Debbie Smith Act of 2023. Uh, the bill, as we have discussed, would reauthorize through 2029 the Debbie Smith DNA Backlog Grant Program, providing grants to state and local governments to improve and expand the collection and analysis of DNA evidence, including evidence in sexual assault kits. I'm a proud co-sponsor of this bill. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we struggled with a serious backlog in rape kits in 2015. We had more than 3,000 untested rape kits. We have made progress in Pennsylvania, but we still have a backlog. Uh, it is reported in 2022 in Pennsylvania, uh, we had 186 backlog sexual assault kits awaiting testing up from 2020 by 22%. There should be no backlog. 
uh, of rape kits, because each one of these kits represents a person who has gone through an extraordinary violent trauma, a survivor, who submitted to an invasive exam in the hope that one day she or he would find justice uh, or would protect another from suffering the similar violence. Uh, the nationwide rape, rape kit backlog is one of the biggest obstacles to prosecutions. Think about it. For every 1,000 rapes, only 13 are ever referred to prosecution. We've got to get to that. And only seven will result in a conviction. And adding to this uh, very sad uh, number of uh, prosecutions and convictions uh, is the backlog of rape kits. Uh, so I'm pleased to support the Debbie Smith Act of 2023. I'm a co-sponsor. Uh, I'm also uh, proud that we just passed it uh, by committee the Rape Kit Backlog Progress Act, uh, which will continue essential support for state and local government to process rape kits, to increase transparency for rape survivors. We must do everything we can to address this unbearable situation, uh, and we must find more prosecutions, more convictions, and save more people from this sexual violence. And I yield back. General Lady yields back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Van Drew. Move to strike the last word. General is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Just very briefly, we spend money on all types of things in this House of Representatives. Um, we allocate money. And it just amazes me that we still have this issue of backlogs. I mean, this is just an issue of humanity. It's, the, it's an issue of doing the right thing, of believing that somebody who's gone through this horrendous crime and will never recover for the rest of their lives, at least that we take care of them and help them in any way we can. Um, I, I remember through my years in the state Senate and um, in other capacities just being horrified when I would get calls from women and they were part of the backlog and didn't get the services they need. Um, they need closure of some kind. Um, so just in the name of humanity, I hope not only, I know we will pass this and I'm so happy to see that it is bipartisan, but I believe also that we should do all that we can to ensure not only is that this piece of legislation passed, that the, the appropriations are made to ensure that there is no longer a backlog. You know, words are easy in speeches, but the reality when you get out in the street and talk to these women um, is different, and we have to fix that. I yield back. Chairman Lewis back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I will rise in support of this reauthorization legislation. And, uh, and I also uh, uh, agree with uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Van Drew, about the fact that talk is cheap. Now, we can reauthorize uh, funding uh, for this very necessary program. Uh, while at the same time, Congress uh, is at a point where we need to pass a spending bill in order to keep the government open and keep programs like this funded. But what we have is extremist uh, MAGA Republicans who want to cut the budget to the bone. They want to cut back, in some cases, uh, 30 percent. Uh, uh, from where we, from our spending level of today. Uh, this is, uh, and, and we have a few extremist MAGA Republicans who, uh, who are insisting that we do that in order to fund the government. Well, if we do that, then programs such as uh, this will take a big hit. And so it makes no sense to say one thing and then vote another. Uh, we need to be consistent. We need to recognize that um, over the years we have been defunding um, uh, government, including law enforcement. And that seeps down to the state and local level as well. We have governors who pound their chest when they announce the relocation of a factory uh, to their state. But what they don't say is that they have offered the multi-billion dollar corporation relocating to their state tax incentives uh, to relocate. 
So in other words, states are now embarking upon a race to the bottom to promise uh, already wealthy, multinational, uh, in many cases, corporations, tax abatements if they will relocate their factories to that particular state. And so if a state is taking in less revenue, then it can't fund its state crime lab, which processes these uh, rape kits. So we've had years, years, years after year of uh, defunding government, one way or the other, uh, federal and state, which has produced the dilemma that we now find ourselves in, which is there's not enough money to process these uh, rape kits uh, all across the country. Uh, we need to stop and think about what we're doing as we uh, uh, continue this uh, trend of defunding government. We need government to protect the people. And this is a way that we protect the people by being able to process these rape kits. We've got to have money for training of officers. Some officers uh, may not uh, fully appreciate the need to collect uh, this evidence when allegations are made. Uh, some local law enforcement departments don't have the technology uh, to uh, keep up with these rape kits that uh, are brought in but never sent to the crime lab. And, and as I said before, uh, the state crime labs are overburdened uh, and can't get to much of the stuff that they have to analyze. And so uh, it, it's, it all goes back to funding. We need to fund training. We need to fund uh, equipment, uh, technology. We need to fund capacity uh, increases. Uh, and you can't do that when you're cutting uh, federal government coffers uh, to the bone. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, a reporting quorum being present. The question is on favorably reporting the bill. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported uh, favorably to the House. Mr. Klein requests a, vote. Mr. Klein requests a recorded vote. Um, Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop, Ms. Sparts, Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bence, Mr. Bence votes yes. Mr. Klein, Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden, Mr. Van Drew, yes. Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels, yes. Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley, Ms. Hageman? Yes. Ms. Hageman votes yes. Mr. Moran? Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Mr. Hunt votes aye. Mr. Fry? Yes. Mr. Fry votes yes. Mr. Nadler? Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Jackson Lee? Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Aye. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Yes. 
Mr. Kiley, you're not recorded. Mr. Kiley votes aye. Mr. Buck, you're not recorded. Mr. Buck votes aye. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman votes yes. Mr. Godin votes aye. Are there any other members who wish to vote who have not yet voted? Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 28 ayes and zero noes. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Member Mr. Chairman, two days to submit views. Who seeks recognition? Yeah, Mr. Goose. Just a parliamentary inquiry, if I might. General State is inquiry. We, I, I see that we've been rejoined by the, the chairman of this august committee. I understand that there's some type of impeachment proceeding in another committee. My understanding was centuries of precedent established that this House, this committee within the House, is actually the proper committee of jurisdiction to consider any kind of articles of impeachment. And I wonder if the chairman might be willing to uh, perhaps explain why this committee has been robbed of its uh, jurisdictional province over impeachment. Um, is, is the gentleman saying he wants articles of impeachment? I, I, far from it. I'd like to see the government funded, but I'm just trying to understand so why I think we would the too. Oversight Committee has become the Judiciary Committee. Perhaps Chairman Jordan might be able to. Chair yields to the chairman. If there are, if there are articles, I, I would just say that if there, if there are articles of impeachment, I think the gentleman from Colorado knows. I believe he might have been a manager on one of the impeachments recently here in our great country. If there are articles of impeachment, uh, that will come in front of this committee, unlike it did when you were an impeachment manager in the last impeachment. Well, I thank the, the chairman for his response. I might add that with respect to that second impeachment, that was days after an insurrection in which there was a, an a effort to subvert the peaceful transfer of power. But nonetheless, I do remember withering criticism from my colleagues four years ago with respect to the first impatement and their protestations. The gentleman is not recognized for, for I general understand. debate. I appreciate uh, the chairman's uh, indulgence nonetheless. But uh, we were in the middle of a uh, roll call. Uh, the ayes have it. The bill's ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views without objection. Staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. The committee will take a brief recess before considering the next bill. The committee stands in recess.
Let me. Is there anyone sitting down there?
right now. Oh, yeah, we got one, two.
The House Judiciary Committee will reconvene. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.J. Res. 11, proposing an amendment to the Constitution of the United States to limit the number of terms that a member of Congress may serve for purposes of markup and move that the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.J. Res. 11, proposing an Not amendment. Without objection, the resolution will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes Mr. Moore for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. According to U.S. term limits, approximately Approximately 82% of American citizens support congressional term limits. This includes 76% of Democrats, 89% of Republicans, and 83% of Independents. The turnover rate for the House incumbents who attempt re-election typically is below 10%. Many voters believe that once in Washington, D.C., incumbents become permanent fixtures who are less responsive to the needs of their constituents. During the 117th Congress, the average length of service for members of the House was 8.9 years, or four and a half House terms. And the average length of the service members of the Senate was 11 years, or 1.8 Senate terms. This proposed constitutional amendment, H.J. Res. 11, would establish limits of three terms for members of the House and two terms for members of the Senate. Congressional term limits are designed to restore competitiveness in the election process. Each House member, for instance, receives nearly a million dollars per year for franked or free mail, staff salaries, and office and travel expenses. While campaigning, incumbents continue to receive their salaries of approximately $174,000 a year, which typically dwarfs the income of challengers who often must resign from their jobs while running for office. Congressional term limits will break the alignment between members of Congress and the special interest groups that support their campaigns. Americans deserve members of Congress who will work for them, who are not bought and paid for by special interest or po party, political parties. This proposed constitutional amendment would put an end to seeing career politicians in Congress and return this body to its representative intention of a citizen legislature. I urge support of this proposed constitutional amendment, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to begin with, I'd like to point out that we already have term limits set forth in the Constitution. They're called elections. I've long opposed artificial term limits for members of Congress because such term limits are fundamentally undemocratic by placing an unjustified limit on voters' preferences for candidates. While I can understand the superficial appeal of term limits, it is up to voters to determine who gets to represent them and for how long. Term limits would also lead to an inexperienced revolving door Congress that is even more susceptible to political brinkmanship and short-term thinking at the expense of long-term policy solutions. A lack of institutional knowledge and expertise resulting from inexperienced legislators would leave Congress dependent on and at the mercy of outside forces, including corporate lobbyists and the other two branches of government. Also, there is a risk that, as members approach the end of their final terms, they might feel less accountability to their constituents because they would no longer face the prospect of defeat at the polls. Instead, they are far more likely to focus on what will help them land their next job than on the job they actually have, serving their district. If you have concerns about the revolving door between Congress and K Street now, just wait until members are forced to find new employment after six years. Mr. Chairman, opposition to term limits is not a partisan issue. Indeed, at a hearing before the Constitution Subcommittee last week, two of our Republican colleagues spoke at length and with great eloquence in opposition to congressional term limits. While they couched their opposition to such term limits in an anti-regulatory frame that I do not agree with, I do agree with their broader point about the dangers of congressional term limits to democracy and to our republic. They spoke of the diminishment of voters' rights, the loss of institutional knowledge and expertise, the lack of accountability at the end of a member's tenure and the general weakening of the people's house, making them susceptible, people's houses, making them susceptible to manipulation by others that would result from term limits. I could not agree more. And given the bipartisan opposition to this resolution, given the wildly low chance this amendment will find the support it needs for enactment, one might ask why we are moving it at all. Could it be because its sponsor, the gentleman from South Carolina, has threatened to oppose various spending measures as House Republicans barrel toward a shutdown? Whatever the motives here, term limits are antithetical to our longstanding belief in democratic Republican government. By taking the decision-making power away from the voters 
and undermining the power and effectiveness of the people's representatives, imposing congressional term limits would be a grave disservice to the American people. Therefore, I strongly oppose H.J. Res. 11. I urge all of my colleagues to vote against it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. Is there any discussion? Ms. Hageman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. General lady is recognized. I am entirely opposed to H.J. Res. 11 and the notion of placing term limits on members of Congress. I understand the frustration not only of members of Congress, but of our constituents. We are all tired of career politicians making promises every two years, then failing to deliver and blaming someone else or something else for that failure. This policy, however, is misguided, misidentifies the source of the problem, and provides the wrong remedy. The real threat to the rights and liberties of the American people isn't found in our ability to vote for our representatives, but in the exponential growth of the unelected, unmovable, and unaccountable federal bureaucracy that has exploded in size and power over the last several decades. These bureaucrats, who are nearly impossible to remove and are encouraged to become career officials through benefits like pensions, have been allowed to burrow into the undergrowth in D.C., yet have never been vetted, interviewed, or approved by the American people. In other words, they have never received a single vote, yet wield massive amounts of power. These officials make policies without being held accountable to any particular geographical or philosophical constituency and are never held responsible if they do something which goes against the needs of the American people, which they routinely and intentionally do. Unlike members of this body, if we do something wrong or something which our, member, which our constituents do not agree, we can be voted out of office. This is in and of itself a term limit of time served. The founders clearly established the primacy of the legislative authority through the long list of enumerated and implied powers granted to Congress as compared to the brevity of the powers granted to the executive branch in Article II. The framers of the Constitution, when debating congressional qualifications, actually discussed term limits because of their inclusion in the Articles of Confederation. After such debate, however, they were dropped during the convention process. Today, bureaucrats often serve in the same agency for their entire professional career. These same officials gain subject matter expertise and institutional knowledge, all the while having been delegated more and more authority by this very body. As a freshman member, I am aware of how different DC is. Our body is unlike anything in the private sector. Getting to know the ins and outs of the federal bureaucracy, let alone getting a handle on the copious amounts of rules and regulations it pushes out is even more difficult. Limiting a House member to six or eight or 10 or even 12 years risks creating a body that is unprepared to legislate, let alone hold administrative officials accountable, something our constituents are expecting us to do. Such an approach will actually make our elected representatives less accountable, not more. Is Washington, D.C. broken? Absolutely. The odds are stacked against the American people in a government which has grown too big and too powerful to control and instead now controls us. But undermining and weakening the only branch of government that is directly elected by the American people is the wrong approach. As I mentioned, I understand the frustration that is at the heart of my colleague's proposed constitutional amendment. I'm willing to work with him and anyone who supports changing the way DC operates by working on legislation that properly identifies and targets the source of the problems we face and prescribes an actual remedy. This could come in the form of term limits for bureaucrats or other measures to ensure accountability and oversight over these unelected officials. I am working on legislation to term limit bureaucrats and would invite, invite all of my colleagues to join me. Reform is necessary and it should come from the people who are actually elected by the American people. The only directly elected officials in town should not become the target. It should be those who are unaccountable. I want to close by reiterating that term limits already exist through elections. The founders laid out what the qualifications are for running for office. But it is also imperative that members of Congress reclaim their rightful place of legislating, take such power back from the unelected bureaucrats, hold themselves accountable by taking difficult but important votes that would put this country back on track, rather than always blaming someone else, including the very bureaucrats and agencies that this body has empowered. This Congress needs to unify so that we can hold accountable those officials federal employees and agencies who act in the best interests of themselves and special interests rather than in the best interests of the United States of America. 
I urge a no vote on HJ Res 11. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And lady yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I join in opposition to this uh, bill. Uh, I, I used to work for uh, Senator Paul Sarbanes when he was a senior member of uh, the Senate in Maryland. And uh, he told me one time that he'd gone on a trip to South Carolina. And while he was going uh, around, he saw a billboard that said, uh, vote for Strom Thurmond. He's been, voting for, uh, he's been fighting for term limits since before you were born. The irony I want to point out on this is that many of the advocates for term limits have served much longer than the number of terms that they're advocating for, or in this instance, uh, pushing a statute to set. I, I disagree with the, the concept of term limits for uh, members of Congress and most legislative bodies, I think for the reasons that have already been stated. Uh, but I will say this, to my colleagues who uh, vote to support this legislation, if you've served, if you've served uh, three terms or more, uh, I think you've got some explaining to do. Because one obvious way we could have term limits is for people to leave after they've served three terms. So if you feel that strongly about it, I, I think you should exercise that right. My predecessor was Anthony Brown. He served three terms, and he ran for another office. He was successful. But he didn't make this a 20-year, 30-year thing, uh, and you don't have to. Nobody requires you to stay here after you get elected, and I'm sure if you decide to step down and not run again, the voters will move on. So please, if, if you want to do it, feel free. But let's not impose a statute or a constitutional effort here uh, that requires people to step down, even though their voters think they should stay, even though they want to stay, and even though they're doing a good job. And with that, I, I yield back. Gentleman goes back, Mr. Gates. Ranking Member Nadler asked a question I can definitely answer. His question is, why are we debating term limits today? And he correctly points out, we're debating term limits today, even though I'm not sure our measure will pass. And there are Republicans who will join in opposition to term limits. I think I can peel back the curtain a bit. In January, during the speaker contest, there were a group of us who wanted to change the way Washington, D.C. operates. That meant changing the spending. That meant advancing balanced budgets. That meant getting House conservatives on committees of great import. But it also meant taking a vote on term limits. We required it. Speaker McCarthy agreed to it. For the last eight months, he's been in breach of that agreement. And just weeks ago, I took to the floor of the House to serve notice of that breach, to inform Speaker McCarthy that if he did not hold a vote on term limits, which we will have today, that he would face a motion to vacate. Well, it seems that those remarks may have animated Speaker McCarthy, because here we are taking this vote. And while I acknowledge it may not pass, what even the opponents of term limits must acknowledge is that term limits are wildly popular in every zip code in America except 202, the Washington, D.C. zip code. You go to almost any place in the country, throw a rock on Main Street. Chances are 8 and 10, it's going to hit somebody who's in favor of term limits. But politicians aren't. I want to address some of the reasons why I think term limits would give us better government. And I've served, I'm, I'm one of the members here who served in both systems. And I will acknowledge that both systems have benefits and drawbacks. But in a term limits environment, you get more fresh ideas. Far too often in Washington, D.C., we revert to a failed and often corrupt muscle memory on how to do things because you got a lot of people here who've been doing them for 10, 20 years, sometimes even longer. So people who are not beholden to the Washington way of thinking will naturally have a more dynamic manner in which to come up with fresh ideas. Second, I think it creates a stronger connection to the district. If the district is generating a new person every six years, then you don't have people who move to Washington, who make their lives in Washington. It becomes temporary, more like the true intent of our founders. And third, I'll use a sports analogy. I don't think anybody would ever like to watch a basketball game without a shot clock. You'd see people just dribbling around, holding the ball, never making a move, never having to present aggressive defense. 
And that kind of feels like how we've been governing for the last several decades. We just govern by omnibus bill and continuing resolution. And so if you have a shot clock, if you know that you get six years in the House, may go on to the Senate for a little bit more public service, but six years in the House, that's going to force people to actually compromise more, to take half a loaf. And by the way, I know that having been in that system. When I was in the state legislature, you know, if there was an issue I cared a lot about, maybe animal welfare, cannabis reform, I would be willing to take less than what was perfect because I knew I only had a certain amount of time there to contribute to that process and I wanted to make, you know, I wanted to be directionally correct in terms of the policies of our state. Here increasingly, you have some of these folks who've seemingly been around since dirt was young and it doesn't unlock that sense of urgency that oftentimes can lead to more productive government. Uh, there is a reason most of our states have term limits. It's because most of the people want it. And in states that have term limits, you have higher frequency of balanced budget. I think you don't have the endemic corruption that we often see in Washington, D.C. And you're not as lashed to the special interests. Like, you know, in a term limits environment, the special interests and lobbyists can't really buy a lawmaker. They can only rent them for six years. And then they have to re-engage that process. And it kind of makes it tougher on the corrupt lobbyists and special interests. But in our system, they buy the cow and spend the rest of their time getting the milk for free. And that might be the reason why we're seeing such opposition to term limits now. Uh, I believe we can have open, honest, transparent government. And we will have this vote, not because it's a comfortable thing for a lot of people to take it, because people are going to be taking a vote that is on the opposite side of like 80% of the country when they vote against this. Well, but will at the least gentleman we'll be able yield? to have that vote. Sure, the, I'll yield, Mr. Ivey. How many terms have you served? Oh, yeah, I'll get to that. I served three terms. But here's the deal. A lot of us who've, ser who've served that amount of time, we actually want to shorten our own sentence, but we don't think our district should have to unilaterally disarm. Right? I think that, it, the, they, so, tell you what, if we can get the, universal will the, will term the limits. Will the gentleman yield? Well, I'm, I, I'm afraid I'm out of time, but I'd love to continue the conversation. There, there's nobody else in your district who's capable of serving in Many Congress. Many more, probably you. far more capable than me. The voters did send me here to the tune of 70% of the vote, but I do think that if, if everyone uh, had the same standard, we, and we all live, I mean, like, you can't really be advocating for us living by different rules in different districts. The Let's just all live by the same rules. I yield back. You can retire whenever you like. Gentlemen's time has expired. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Gentlemen's time has expired, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. We all know that term limits exist with the voter. You're on the ballot, and the voters have a choice. And if you have this artificial term limit put in, then the voters, the only person they don't have a choice in choosing is the person with the most experience and a record of where they've been on issues, which the people want to know about. That's the person who they wouldn't have an opportunity to vote for. This is maybe wildly popular, some people say. Well, people who get 70% of the vote or people that get 86% of the vote are wildly popular. The public in my district is not clamoring for term limits. I've had people come up to me over the years and tell me, never retire, don't you ever quit. They support me because I'm responsive, I know the issues, I stand up for my district, and I'm not beholden to lobbyists. To suggest that everybody in this Congress is beholden to lobbyists and they're rented and they're bought is wrong. Most of the people in this House of Representatives are good, honest, hardworking people. We may have a disagreement on our positions on issues, we may have a different constituency that we need to represent, but most, I would say 90% of the people here are scrupulously honest, hardworking, and care about their jobs. And to suggest that they're rented or they're bought is a wrong statement to make, and it besmirches this entire body. But then people who want to shut down the government and who didn't want the election to be carried out in the Electoral College and tried to work with the previous president to get around democracy and to trample on it and to try to take over the Senate and hang Mike Pence were the kind of people that would, could easily come out and say they're for term limits because it sounds good and they're just trying to get the people on their side when they're not on the people's side. So this, this proposal, which has been around for a long time, it's a constitutional amendment, we shouldn't be, I wondered why we were voting on it. 
it made no sense, but if this is part of the ransom that was held by the 15 or 20 people who are holding this country hostage right now by not agreeing to have a continuing resolution that will pay the military, that will pay your individuals at TSA who will have to work but not get paid, who will pay your federal employees who have to work but won't get paid. People work paycheck to paycheck, a lot of people. They're going to have to work essential services, but they won't have any money to pay for their, their bills, their children's bills, their school bills, and the folks who are shutting down the government don't care about them. They may claim they care about them, but they don't care about them in practice because they're saying work and don't get paid while we stand up here and claim we're fighting for a balanced budget or we're caring about the, how much money's in government. And the money they're against in government is the money that goes to the poor kids who don't have parents that can afford to give them food that they need in schools, food to, to sustenance during the day, that need help and education because they have disabilities. They don't care about those people. They want to cut those programs. They want to cut housing for the poor. Those programs they want to cut. But for the military and for taxes, where the rich get the best deal, they don't want to change that at all. So don't be misled by those people. Remember, this is going to be a Republican shutdown. They're going to shut it down. They're going to ask you to work. They're going to tell you to work, and they're not going to pay you. That's wrong. We need to be working not on this hooey legislation, just like the hooey they work for next door on impeachment of Joe Biden, a man having no basis to impeach whatsoever because he's, they even admit, and their chief witness admits, there's no proof whatsoever he did anything wrong. We've got another bill on this calendar about saying any federal president that's an, an indicted has to be tried in federal court. This used to be the people's house. Now it's Trump's house. Let's put all the president's criminal behavior, and there hasn't been many presidents with criminal charges, let's have them tried in federal court so their appeals go to their Supreme Court so that they have a different jury pool to pick for. If they violate the laws of Georgia, they should be tried in Georgia. If they violate the laws of New York, they should be tried in New York. And there's nothing in our Constitution that says you can do such a bill. The Constitution spells out which cases go to federal court, and it's not the cases of your your president who chooses, selects only the best people and who never lies and who never makes a mistake, quote unquote. It's not for them to have all their cases tried in federal court. That's unconstitutional too. This is hooey. Next door was hooey. What's going on on the floor is hooey. There's a lot of hooey. Too much hooey to go around. I yield back my balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Nails. The desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Reserve a point of order. Gentleman reserves a point of order. Amendment to H.J. Res. 11 offered by Mr. Nels of Texas. Page 2, line 6, strike 3 terms and insert. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Mr. Nails is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is very clear and simple. It, uh, it's an amendment to H.J. Resolution 11 that would simply increase the number of terms for House members from three terms to six terms, three to six. And I have a great deal of love and respect for my friend from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, but uh, I agree with him. I agree, we need term limits, no question. Uh, but I believe there are several issues with the underlying resolution. And I, I think six years uh, for a member of the House, I think it's insufficient. And I say that because, uh, I don't believe we have any members in our conference that serve as chairs of our committees that have under 10 years. Matter of fact, I don't believe we have a freshman, sophomore, or junior in our conference that serves maybe even as a subcommittee chair under the A committees. So my point is, is that uh, I've been up here, what, 33 months? I guess I could say I'm still trying to navigate these treacherous waters up here, trying to find a safe lily pad to land on every once in a while, but we're continuing to learn. I guess you could say maybe a little wet behind the ears yet, trying to figure out how to deal with this swamp that we call Washington, D.C. So uh, the idea that after three terms we're out the door, I think many members would probably say uh, many of us don't have uh, that skill set to, and that historical knowledge to manage some of our more complicated committees here, but I believe 12 years would be appropriate. By limiting the service in the House to three terms, 
and service in the Senate to two terms, we are inherently saying that the House's work is less important than that of our Senate colleagues. With members in the House for only six years compared to staff, and we got staff up here to have been here for decades, uh, we would be leaving the country, quite honestly, to be run by those who have not been elected. There are other questions. How will committee chairs be determined with such little experience? How about the speaker in leadership roles? I think these are some questions that we have to ask ourselves. Uh, therefore, I encourage my colleagues to vote for this amendment, which will limit the number of qualifying terms for House members to six terms in order to make it consistent with our center counterparts. Three terms is not enough. I want to be very, very clear. I support term limits. We're just going to disagree as to exactly how, how long a member of the House should serve. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes Mr. Nadler. Uh, first of all, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman's point of order is withdrawn. And withdrawn. second of all, I move to strike the previous question. You mean the, the last word? word. The last word. <laughs> the gentleman uh, seeks recognition to speak on the amendment. The gentleman is recognized. <coughs> After all these years, I, I make that mistake. Um, I'm opposed to this amendment because it does not fix the fundamental flaw with the bill. Uh, term limits of any sort, aside from the term limits imposed uh, by elections, by the, by the Constitution, uh, are contrary to the obvious, uh, contrary to the will of the framers, uh, first of all, you need a constitutional amendment to do it. Uh, but second of all, um, as was stated before, uh, term limits, I don't care how, whether you make it at six years or 12 years, uh, are going to transfer power to the staff against the unelected, uh, 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 as opposed to the elected members of the House and Senate. And second of all, um, it will, uh, it, it, it will lead to, people, to members uh, looking uh, for their next job uh, and possibly uh, uh, bending on various legislative matters with a look toward employment as a lobbyist or for some interest group. And that's exactly what we don't need. So I, uh, uh, it happens already, but it, this would greatly increase it. So I uh, uh, oppose the amendment as I do the bill. I yield back. Is there further discussion on the amendment, uh, Mr. Massey? I move to strike the last word. I was recognized. I support Mr. Nail's amendment. Uh, I'm here in my sixth term, and I'm just now figuring out how the Rules Committee works. And if you don't know how the Rules Committee works, you don't know a lot about how this place works. And I'm not even going to claim to understand how it works half as well as the staff who uh, work on the Rules Committee know how it works. So anybody who thinks in three terms you can figure out how this place works uh, is still in the dark, frankly. Uh, and so I think the gentleman's point about putting the Senate on a stronger footing than the House is also a concern. Why should they serve for longer than House members serve? Um, I think that's dangerous. We're looking to get jammed by the Senate here any, any day now um, by their spending bills, even though the, the spending and tax authority should originate in the House, as the Constitution says. But you may not know that if you've only been here three terms. <laughs> uh, another point is you could be here three terms and never be in the majority, never really have any say. And um, that, because in the House, if you're in the minority, you really, it's not like the Senate. You're not that relevant. Uh, it's a lot easier because, the, and the reporters don't even care what you have to say. They don't show up outside the conference uh, after every meeting if you're in the minority. So I think it's a good idea to extend it to six terms and um, for this and, and the other reasons. Yield? I will yield to the ranking member. Well, thank you. I think you just said that the, uh, You've been here six terms and are just learning how the Rules Committee operates. Under the Nell's Amendment, you would be out before completely learning how the Rules Committee <laughs> operates. So the Nell's Amendment uh, is not an improvement on the bill itself. If, the, if uh, reclaiming my time, if the ranking member would like to modify Nell's Amendment to change six terms to eight terms. No, uh, I, I would, would oppose the amendment I would, uh, as I will oppose that the as bill. well. 
And um, I have supported bills, term limit bills that have six terms for the House. And so just to be consistent and just based on my own experience and just not to be a hypocrite, uh, I'm going to support Mr. Nail's amendment and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Further discussion? Ms. Scanlon. I'd move to strike the last word. And the ladies recognized. Thank you. Um, I, I do agree with Ranking Member Nadler that I would oppose the amendment because I don't think it improves the fundamental flaws of the underlying bill. As members on both sides of the aisle have pointed out, um, our Constitution already has a mechanism for term limits. It's called voting. Every two years in the House, every six years in the Senate, and that comports with what our founders intended. They explicitly discussed this issue, and the Supreme Court in U.S. Term Limits, Inc. versus Thornton said that in the United States representative democracy, people should be able to choose whom they please to govern. And that's at bottom line what we're talking about here. We've all seen in this Congress, for example, that there are some people who, after decades of service, still have very much to contribute, both in institutional knowledge, in fidelity to public service, and we've seen those who have just been elected who never should have been here in the first place and probably should be removed. So the voters should have the absolute stay, and what we would do best under these circumstances is to empower an engaged electorate to make it easier, not harder, for eligible persons to vote, to remove the influence of dark money in our elections. Um, you know, that is where I think we should be focusing our attention. I do want to thank the gentleman from Florida for making clear the origin of this amendment. He said it is wildly popular in the polls. Um, and that is what we are seeing this week. Last week in Congress, we are voting on things that are wildly popular in certain polls, rather than on actually doing the hard work to fund the government, which requires people to work together across the Senate, across the House, across the aisle, rather than migrating to the most extreme elements in the Chaos Caucus. So with that, I would yield back. Would the gentlewoman yield? I already yielded back. Uh, apparently not. Uh, further discussion, Mr. Johnson. Yes, I, I want to thank the chairman uh, for yielding that move to strike the last word. Um, this is a really important discussion and it's one that's long overdue. Uh, I got to Congress, uh, Mr. Gates and I came in together in the same class. Uh, we've been here, we're on our fourth term. We have filed term limits bills uh, ever since we got here. I, I think, if, if my memory is correct, I think the first bill that I sponsored or co-sponsored was a term limits bill. We have never had a hearing, so far as I know, um, in the modern era on the subject, at least not so long as I've been involved, and so this is a day that's a long time coming. It's an important conversation. Um, some, some important points have been made here, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Nell's amendment that um, in his mind, the, the best case scenario, for, at least for the House, would be six terms as opposed to three, as the current bill uh, stands. I'm, I have to confess, I'm not exactly sure what the magic number is, but I do believe the principle is the right one, and I think this is a healthy debate. I'm under no illusion, like, like Mr. Gates said, that this is going to pass and become law anytime soon, but I think it's something we need to talk about and, and duly consider, and here's why. Because we all know that we're living in unprecedented times. We're only 247 years into this grand experiment in self-governance, and as a constitutional law attorney, I spent my career there before I came to Congress, I think a lot about what the founders intended. One thing we all should agree on, what they certainly intended, is, was that this body, the, the which we've become the greatest legislative body and arguably in the history of the world, uh, that it would be composed of citizen legislators, not professional politicians, career politicians, that, that, that people in, in their era, in their mind, um, you would have people from broad walks, different walks of life, different skill sets, sets of experiences, life experiences. They would bring uh, different levels of acumen to the table, but they would all have things to contribute, and they would come to Washington and serve for a period of years, and then they would go back to their real life. They would go back to the blacksmith shop or the farm or the law practice or whatever. Um, that has become an idea of the past, and I think it's hurt the institution. If you look at the polling right now across the country, I mean, we have record low approval levels of, of Congress and also all of our institutions of government. Right now, we could all agree, you go home, if you did town halls and over the, the district work period, you probably heard a lot of what I've heard. 
we can't trust government. We can't trust any institution of government. Part of which, since we're here in the Judiciary Committee, and this is under our, just, our jurisdiction, part of the, the reason for that, the big problem, is the weaponization and politicization of the Department of Justice, by the way, that you know, there's a two-tiered system of justice, and, and they see uh, special treatment for the mighty and the powerful like the Biden family, and overly aggressive prosecution of, of his, the president's political opponent, Mr. Trump, by way of one glaring example. We're, we're having a, a hearing simultaneously over an oversight about the uh, staggering level of corruption and then cover-up of Hunter Biden and the Biden families profiting off their office and their family brand. All that is to say that the only way, these are desperate times, desperate co times call for desperate measures, and if we're going to restore the people's trust in the institution of Congress and in government itself, maybe the time has come for term limits. I certainly think it has. Let me read you one quick synopsis. Uh, there was an article from the Heritage Foundation in 1994. This idea has been bandied around about. They say skepticism about and distaste for long-term political careerism are central to the American experience. Term limits were contained in America's first governing document, by the way, we forget, the Articles of Confederation. They do not appear in the Constitution. Why? Primarily because its drafters saw them as, quote, entering into too much detail for a short document. It wasn't that they were opposed to it. They were trying to keep the Constitution concise. Several modern presidents have supported congressional term limits, and since the Constitution was amended in 1951 to limit presidents to two terms, many political scientists have observed that congressional term limits could cure the imbalance between these two branches of the federal government. The American people are in favor of the concept, and here's why, in short summary. It prevents people in power from becoming too powerful. That's the beauty of our republic and representative government, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and their duly elected representatives, and also, it better reflects the will of the people, because then you do allow them uh, to bring in new people, new ideas, fresh ideas. I also served in my state legislature. We had term limits in Louisiana, and I think it serves the body well. And you've seen a, a, a revolving uh, group of leaders and people come in and fresh faces and new ideas, and I think that's, that's, I think that's healthy. I think it's good. And at the end of the day, I think ultimately it will help us restore trust in this institution. And to me, that is um, a root problem that we all need to be working on. So for all those reasons, I'm still thinking about the, the six terms, Mr. Nels, but uh, I appreciate uh, you lending that to the discussion. And I think through this process, we'll come with the right number. I'm out of time, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. General Eddie's recognized. Thank you. Uh, I rise in opposition to H.J. 11, uh, and I also rise in opposition to this amendment for the repeated uh, notion that we are talking about a possible constitutional amendment. It should not be done lightly or frivolously, although I want to compliment Mr. Nels for offering this amendment because it does at least uh, even up that lopsided nature of the original bill, which would have uh, members of the House out in six years and members of the Senate out in 12. So I, I applaud that part of it, but I still am opposed to all of this for very simple reasons. Um, we are term limited in multiple ways. Number one, some of the gentlemen who are speaking here in favor of term limits uh, and in favor of whether three or six in the House are beyond that. They could self-term limit. They could not run for election again. Stand up, be that independent soul that says, you're right, we need fresh ideas in here, fresh blood, self-term limit. Number two, we're term limited by our voters. We stand for elections. Our voters decide. It is their choice who is going to be their closest representative, their closest federal representative. So voters, I don't want to take that choice away from voters. Now, I recommend, I mean, I, I recognize that there are some states that have terribly gerrymandered districts so some voters really don't get a say. They're given a representative and they're told who it's going to be. So we need to fix gerrymandering. We need to fix dark money in elections. Um, I was thinking about it. We can all uh, think about a few members who we think uh, should not be here, wish they were term limited out. But think about those who were not term limited out. Would we have wanted John Lewis to have left in six years? Would we have wanted Elijah Cummings to stop giving to this body, to this country, uh, both of those men, their spirit of service, of eth ethics, of equity, their wisdom and their passion for the Constitution, the rule of law, and this country, their love of country? Uh, and for those who just said on the other side, 
uh, citizens keep railing that they can't trust government, they can't trust the institutions. Strange, it's those very members who say that over and over again, who use the MO of a former president to tear down our independent institutions. Whether it is uh, our, our um, electoral process, they tried right up to the election and then, of course, after the election to tear down faith in our free and fair elections. Wrongly, the Department of Justice tear down our faith in an independent Department of Justice. How about the news media? Those who would say the news media is not an independent institution valuable to this country, but would call it the enemy of this state, the crooked media. If people are worried about the tearing down of our faith in independent institutions, stop doing it yourself. Finally, we're here at a week where we're about to shut this government down. Actually, we're not going to shut this government down through the malpractice of those on the other side. Whether they are here for one term or 10, this government will likely shut down, hurting the American people. If you're getting at the problem of members of Congress, this false notion of a constitutional amendment is frivolous, you know it. Let's not shut this government down, let's do your job. I yield back. Actually, will the gentlelady yield? Apparently uh, not. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Tiffany. Oh. Mr. Tiffany. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nails. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. Uh, we just heard Ms. Dean say, and I think, quote, we're term limited by our voters. I think Ms. Scanlon said something, I'm paraphrasing, that we have elections and, and we should let the voters decide. One thing that we do know is that well over 90% of the incumbents that are up for re-election, they get re-elected. They get re-elected over and over and over again. And I know that this administration has a very poor approval rating, but the approval rating of Congress is lower than whale feces. And we continue to get re-elected. And why is that? It's about the money. Everybody's out there working with the special interest groups. They're getting the big fat cats to support them. You have millions of dollars in your campaign re-election accounts. And how do you expect somebody to compete with that? In approval rating most of the time in the single digits. And we keep getting re-elected over and over and over again. It just doesn't make sense to me. But what it is, is because of all the special interests and all the money that these incumbents that we're receiving up here, it's very, very hard to change direction with such a, a, a dismal record. So again, yeah, let the voters decide, but really, is it really the voters decide when you have so much money in your account to go out there and spread a message? And it, it's just, it's uncalled for. Uh, we need to have some term limits. We need to keep it to 12 years because it will give us some time to get our feet up underneath us and try to manage this very difficult, swampy area of Washington, D.C. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to respect the last I'm sorry, word. the time belonged to Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Uh, thank you. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman was recognized. And uh, Mr. Chairman, some may be surprised that uh, Hank Johnson is in favor of term limits, but not for myself, uh, only for United States Supreme Court justices <laughs> and for the very reasons that my good friend uh, Mr. Gates talked about. I mean, it's an opportunity when you uh, because we don't have lifetime tenure like Supreme Court justices do. We are term limited. We serve at the will of the voters every two years. We come up for a referendum on whether or not we come back. And I respect the intelligence and the intellect of the voters uh, for uh, making decisions to send us back. While I do admit that there is too much dark money in the process, and that dark money, by the way, was unleashed by a uh, lifetime tenured United States Supreme Court. That's why my friend um, uh, Representative Schiff 
and I, along with other members of this body, last week filed the Term Act, which would establish uh, term limits for Supreme Court justices because they are the ones who now are existing based on the corrupt lobbyist and special interest spending that is done on them, taking luxury vacations, flying around on private jets, getting your mama's house paid for by a billionaire, and then your mama staying rent free for the last 10 years in the house, getting your sons uh, or your, your godsons or, or nephews uh, tuition at a private uh, a swank uh, uh, school paid uh, by a billionaire, uh, the purchase of a, a, a luxury um, 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 recreational vehicle, which would never be seen in a Walmart parking lot, by the way. All of these things brought and paid for by uh, special interest uh, who have infected the United States Supreme Court now. So I agree that term limits are necessary uh, to make sure that there are fresh ideas always coming onto the court as opposed to folks parading around as originalists uh, when it suits them. Uh, also, term limits uh, provide a stronger connection to the people. Uh, accountability, in other words. We have a Supreme Court that is unaccountable, uh, no connection to the people, not uh, anybody uh, hanging out in a Walmart parking lot, just somebody perpetrating that they are. They're so far removed, going to luxury, all-male uh, 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 meetings. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's just pathetic. Uh, endemic corruption has taken hold on the United States Supreme Court. That's why we need term limits there. But I agree with Mr. Massey. Uh, you know, after six terms, you're kind of just getting your feet wet and um, you're starting to understand how this place operates. Now, I believe that our citizens should always have the ability to bring us home if they think that we're doing a bad job. But if they feel like they're being represented, we need to have the ability of the citizens, the will of the citizens to be recognized and deferred to. So I rise in opposition to the underlying bill as well as the amendment. And with that, I want to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Swalwell. I, I do find it comical that there's a conversation among my MAGA colleagues that they would be interested in leaving this job through a term limit because for the last six plus years with Donald Trump in the political ether, I've seen them make a number of decisions where they put their job over the country, where it appears to me that there's a fear that you couldn't get another job because you're afraid of doing the right thing and then being primaried and losing your job. And I'm not just saying that because that's the hot take that I have. That's what you all tell us privately. We've talked to you and you've told us, I don't like what Donald Trump did with Russia. I don't like how close he is with Putin. I don't like that he tried to burn down the Capitol and made us all run for our own safety. But I can't say that because I'm going to get primaried at home. So I don't see a lot over there that actually would be willing to leave this job. You do everything to keep this job. You put the country at risk to keep this job. So this is nonsense that you would even be willing to put a term limit on yourself because all you have to do is the right thing and then you'd show us that you're serious. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think Mr. Swalwell was agreeing with the opposition to term limits while being a little more disagreeable than we all should be, and I regret that. Sorry about that, Daryl. Well, I regret it because, in fact, this is an incredibly serious discussion. Uh, Mr. Swalwell and I both come from California, we had an experiment in term limits, uh, and it, although it still exists, it had to be modified and had to be modified because we had no expertise and because the revolving door became uh, an epidemic when you only had six years, and the same will probably be true in 12, you're always looking for that next job. You're looking for the next thing in your career, so if you can't jump to this, you jump to that. 
So if you look at our members of the assembly for this in the entire period of the six-year term limit, what we find uh, is we find people who were everywhere in government or in lobbying, and the assembly was simply one of the steps they took. Now, having said that, I have a different reason for opposing the underlying bill and the, uh, the amendment. And it's not because I didn't willingly leave here uh, after nine terms. Uh, it's because I served with people like Henry Hyde, Nancy Pelosi, Jane Harmon, the list uh, on either side, Don Young. I've served with men and women of the House, with people who made a decision to remain here for all the right reasons. I may have disagreed with some of them on one side or the other. Heck, I disagree with some in my own party from time to time. But they were institutional. I served with John Dingell, and as a freshman with John Dingell, the longest serving member uh, on the Democrat side, and uh, uh, Don Young, longest serving member on the Republican side, I had the honor to serve with both of them. Their institutional memory as part of the collective has a value that you cannot replace if you give it away through this amendment, either of the amendments, the underlying bill or this. And I would say this, those who study, those who are here for a short time and those who are here for a long time, all know that the average length of time that somebody is in the House is about six years, some less and many more. But the many more every 10 years face a redistricting in most cases, face other challenges. Many of the members that, that I lament losing, uh, like uh, 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 Howard Berman, lost to one of his, his own uh, members in a redistricting, and I miss him. And if he were still here on this committee, we would have a wonderful piece of institutional memory and somebody who knew how to work on his side when appropriate and across the aisle when appropriate. So I'm speaking as someone who left the House, has only been back here, I'm only in my second term back here, someone who's given an exemption in this thing that effectively goes past my natural and desired retirement. I'm speaking because I don't want to lose that institutional memory. I know the value of it. And for those who talk about extremists on either side of the aisle, they are very, very often members who have not been here that long. And many, many members over time realize that the vast majority of legislation that ever becomes law is bipartisan. It does the necessary compromise. And that compromise is not for corporate America. That compromise is for the American people. So I know I haven't given you anything other than I'm the old guy who's been here a long time and I'm sitting at the top of the dais. But I will tell you this, I've seen the damage, my fellow Californians have seen the damage, and it is not the right thing to have a revolving door for every member. Plenty of our members leave too soon, but those who stay, like Don Young, like Henry Hyde, like Nancy Pelosi, and yes, like the late John Dingell, they add to this institution in a way you cannot add through staffing. And with that, I thank uh, all of you and yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, as one old guy to another, I'd like to associate myself with um, Chairman Issa's remarks there. Uh, I, let me say this. I, I do think that um, opposition, regardless of whether it's six years or 12 years, is, is the only way to go on this issue. And, and, and a couple of reasons have already been stated. I've, I've stated some already, but just uh, a couple of quick points. One is, as a former staffer on the Hill, uh, I'd like to just put that perspective on there too, because one of the things that uh, is important is we don't want to have the staff running the show here. And having staff with outstanding talent, institutional knowledge, and the like is important. It's great to have people you can turn to uh, for that. But I think it's important to understand that if you're turning everybody out in six years or 12 years, um, you're not going to have, as, as Chairman Issa was just saying a moment ago, members who've been here long enough to develop that expertise themselves. And, and so what you're going to be left with is people turning to the staff to help 
basically run the show. The other piece of that, too, that's also problematic, and I'm a former lobbyist as well, and so one of the things that happens with staff who stayed a long time and then leave as they go become lobbyists. Now, if you don't have members who've been here long enough to have, you know, develop that kind of deep institutional knowledge themselves, the other source they're gonna turn to is the lobbying community. And I, I don't know really anybody, um, I could be wrong, but my friend's on the other side of the aisle over there. I don't know any of you all think that that's a great way to go. We don't necessarily want to have people who've been here for such little amounts of time that the lobbyists and the staffs are the place they have to turn to actually get that kind of information, as opposed to colleagues who've been here, as Chairman Issa mentioned, 20, 30 years themselves. Um, and then w one last quick point, and I'll, I'll yield back. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that my predecessor stayed here for six years and then left. Um, I previously, I'd been state's attorney in Prince George's County. I was twice elected, wasn't opposed in the second race, but decided not to run for a third term because I thought it was right for me to move on and that it would be a good thing to have, uh, you know, uh, someone, other people have a chance to run for the seat. So I voluntarily decided not to run again. Uh, to my colleagues here who are really pushing the term limits issue, I, I just want to say that the House of Representatives is not Hotel California. The fact that you got here elected here doesn't mean you've got to stay here. And if you think it's better for the institution that, that people should be leaving in six years or 12 years or whatever it is, by all means, I'll come to the going away party. We'll, you know, wish you the best. You can go lobby on K Street or whatever you want to do next. But imposing that through a constitutional amendment, I think is the wrong way to go. And one last point, I forget who, somebody said that 90% of the people who run for re-election get, get, get re-elected. And, I, you know, the, and I, I guess he thought that was a negative thing, but from my perspective, isn't that democracy? Isn't it important for us to say, well, let's let the voters decide, and if the voters decide they wanna hang on to this member of Congress for a little bit longer, why not? I've, in my neighboring district is Steny Hoyer. He's been in Congress for over 40 years. He's been an outstanding member of Congress. People like him on both sides of the aisle. I personally think he's been the best majority leader this, this institution's ever seen. Apparently the voters agree, even with the changes in the lines, as the, the member mentioned a few minutes ago. He's been able to, to keep getting reelected decade after decade after decade. I don't think that's a bad thing. So with that, I, 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 and I'll, if somebody has, I, I yield to Chairman Issa. Yeah, I appreciate very much your associating in, uh, with my remarks, but I'm gonna come back to something you said that, that I didn't say that, that you, you alluded to. You know, there were Republicans here and Democrats here who have been in the majority, minority, and majority. And it's an oddity that Steny Hoyer and uh, Congresswoman Pelosi and quite frankly, our team on our side, the, the, those speakers, Speaker McCarthy and Speaker Pelosi, they were at the top, we lost the majority, and they in no small part were the ones that organized their respective party to retake the majority and then led. And I think in a sense, if nothing else, this amendment ignores the idea of the leadership that we choose almost habitually are those people who can bring us together and they've learned to do it usually over a number of years. So I think I named a lot of names that were not, you know, chairs or were chairs but not speaker. Thank you for letting me, remi reminding me that our leadership is made up of those people that we would lose. Gentlemen's time has expired. Is there further discussion? Mr. Roy. I thank the chairman. Um, I would like to speak in support of the underlying bill, um, and I would also like to speak in support of the amendment. Uh, I will vote for both, and there are a variety of reasons why. Um, first of all, the Congress is disastrously broken. There is no other way to put it, no matter which side of the aisle you are on, no matter what part of the ideological spectrum you sit, it is disastrously broken. 
There are a lot of examples I could give, but the 33 trillion examples is probably the best one. It is just an abject failure and has been for my entire life. I'm 51 years old. I am hard pressed to think of many things that this body has done over those 51 years that are particularly all that productive for the grand scheme of advancing this republic's interest. It's just broken. And I don't know anybody in America across the country, for the most part, who doesn't feel that way. We poll consistently below 20%. Term limits poll consistently above 80%. Now, there's a reason for that. Now, sure, do I think in the abstract and the theory that the best term limit is the voting booth? Yeah, sure. But the problem here is we all get it between gerrymandering for political purposes, gerrymandering and line drawing because of the Voting Rights Act or whatever it is, there are lines that are drawn all over our country that perpetuate parties and members of Congress that consistently stay there. And this idea that expertise is somehow the reason to say, oh, we should just keep staying here in perpetuity, I think is insane. And with all due respect to the point being made about, well, you can just choose to leave Congress, yeah, but that's not the problem. The average age and the average length of time that people serve in Congress is 8.9 years. That's not the problem. The problem isn't that rank and file members don't come and go. The problem is that a handful of octogenarians sit around here and screw this place up repeatedly, indefinitely. They continue to run this place right into the ground. That's the truth. And, and we, we just reward it. So I'm gonna support this. It's probably not gonna pass for whether it gets out of committee and the number of votes that it takes to amend the Constitution of the United States. But I tell you what, one thing we could propose, we don't have to have a constitutional amendment to say that, okay, after 12 years of service, if you love being a representative and bringing your grand expertise to this grand august body so much, how about you do it for no pay? And how about you do it for uh, no uh, grand uh, position as a chairman or a leader? You just wanna come here and share your expertise, great, but why don't we just adopt rules? Doesn't require a constitutional amendment that says, if you come here for a seventh term, you will receive no pay, you will not serve as a chairman, and you will not serve in leadership. Great, come here and share all your infinite wisdom. But I think this place needs new blood. I think it does need turnover. Um, and again, there are great members of Congress who have served here terms well past 12 years or well past six years. And there are many terrible first-term members of Congress. And I'm sure many think I'm a terrible third-term member of Congress. That's fine. All I'm saying is this place has got to change. And that's what the American people are demanding. And I don't know if 82% of the American people think, you know what, maybe we ought to limit how long people can sit here and continue to do damage to the United States of America. Perhaps, perhaps we should listen to them in a representative democracy. And I think that's part of the big problem. We never really listen to the people in this representative democracy. And yes, a republic requires us to make good decisions and figure out how to do it. But in the end, we should try to represent the overall views of the American people. I am pretty confident that a majority of constituents in every state in the union support some form of term limits. And the reason I'm gonna to agree to the 12-year amendment is because I think it has the best chance of success, um, a better chance of success, if you will, than three terms. Um, and I realize there are some groups out there who might you know, uh, criticize that, believing that the uh, purity of three terms is the best. Well, so be it. This is, in fact, the legislative process at work. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Ms. Ballant. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to start by saying I love this country. I love this democracy. I care deeply about it, not just because I am, I am so honored to be able to represent my state, uh, but also I'm a child of an immigrant family that came here for a better life. Um, and I'm also a former social studies and civics teacher. And I actually have really enjoyed this conversation. It is an important, robust conversation. And I want to say the uh, 
Uh, the Republican, uh, Mr. Johnson, has said some really interesting things earlier about um, record low approval for Congress and concerns about trusting government. I share those concerns. Um, I come from a citizen legislature in Vermont. It is incredibly important for us to be rooted in our communities and to constantly be uh, accountable to our constituents back home. And so that, uh, I, I, I agree with you. And certainly some of the things that, that you said, Mr. Roy, it, it does have to change, absolutely. Where I think we disagree is what, what are the things that we can do in the near term? And so these conversations are important. This is why we are here. We are supposed to be a deliberative body. But I think we know that this constitutional amendment is, is not gonna go anywhere. But there is actually something that we could do now, which does not take a constitutional amendment. And so I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm really trying to be fully present and appreciate the, the, the real passion that people have for this topic. But it's difficult to not have this other voice inside of me saying, but I am serving in Congress with a colleague who is a serial fabulist, somebody who lied about just about everything about his history, um, about his record, about his career, in order to get elected. And I think that contributes to this feeling that it's broken, that there's no bottom. Mr. That Chairman, I, I, I would raise a point of order. I don't think you can engage in personalities towards Senator Menendez like that. Uh, the I, I've not heard uh, a name mentioned until the gentleman uh, so I will, uh, I will rule the uh, debate is in order and the gentlelady may continue. I've been very careful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My point is, we know who I'm talking about. His constituents have said, we don't feel represented. Many colleagues have said, he is not helping us with our credibility. He is not helping for us to win back the trust of the American people. So why do we spend so much time on things that it's not gonna happen when we could do things right now that would rebuild credibility? I have, I have teenagers right now, and I know some folks in this room also have kids they're trying to raise. And I come home on Friday nights and they say, what's the point? What's the point when somebody can be making up all aspects of his career to get elected and to serve, and there's no consequence for that. And I don't have a good answer. And so I wish that we all could do a better job of holding each other and ourselves to higher standards, because that is what is going to help the American people have more trust in the work that we're doing. Again, I do think this is an important conversation. I think it's complicated. But why do we spend so much time on things that are simply about grandstanding and not about actually doing something right now that could help this very, very troubling situation? I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, Mr. Van Drew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, this, this is uh, a difficult issue. Uh, there are those that would say, and, and I can relate to that a little bit, that if someone only serves three terms, they're going to be just learning, really getting underneath their belt what they need to do and how to operate and how to be independent. And if they are, we're constantly a Congress with new people coming in all the time, uh, that we're going to have an issue of experience. And with that issue of experience, uh, those folks are going to rely upon lobbyists more. They are going to rely on the institutions more, uh, those that are here, the bureaucracy more. And I understand that. So to me, uh, three terms is just too short. Uh, six makes more sense. Uh, quite frankly, I will vote for both just to move these bills out of committee. Uh, I think they deserve to be heard more. At the same time, I understand what some folks are saying. People are tired, man, 
I mean, I, if there's one thing I try to do in my whole political, and I've been a state senator, an assemblyman, a mayor, a county commissioner, I try to talk to people. And I know a lot of folks don't do that as much as I do, but I do. Every single day, I call a certain number of people on the phone when they've expressed concerns about things or talk to them on the street. And I'll tell you what, I'm sure there are many folks that do that, but the bottom line is people are sick to death of it. The institution is broken to some degree. We do have too much debt. We do have too many problems. And yes, we have members, quite frankly, I know you were targeting one, uh, in those previous comments, but we have members on the both sides of the aisle uh, that have issues. But hopefully that will be taken care of in the voting booth. And in the abstract, the voting booth should take care of everything. And it's interesting that people love their own congressperson, but do not necessarily love the institution. So I'm torn with this issue because sometimes experience is good. And I've known in, in every, every level of government, members that were new to the government that were quite frankly horrible. And I've known members that have been there for countless numbers of years that were horrible and new members that were great and members that have been there many years that were great as well. So it's not an easy issue, but I do know what we're reacting to. If anybody believes that we are in a time where business as usual can just continue, they are wrong. People are sick to death, they're tired of it. They're tired of more and more of their paycheck going towards taxes. They're tired of the debt that this country has. They're tired of not believing. And you know, I know everybody says MAGA is a great thing. We, they like to use that as a, I'm sorry, a detrimental thing. But make America great, America is great. America should be number one. America should be the best and strongest and most focused nation in the world. And people don't feel that way right now. People are suffering through this. They really are. So I, 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 I'm gonna, I, I think this needs more of an opportunity to be aired. It needs more of an opportunity to be heard. I quite frankly haven't made my final decision if it was up to a final vote. But I do tell you, and again, I know I'm emphasizing this. Don't think it's just the same old stuff. It isn't. We are coming to a breaking point in this nation. And if we want to stay a republic, I know we always talk about a democracy, and that's important, but we are a republic. And you know, Benjamin Franklin said, I give you a republic if you can keep it. And that's the question. Can we keep it if we just keep doing what we've been doing? We must change. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Sparts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. And uh, I actually thought about this issue for some time, and I think our founding fathers did too. And they decided not to prescribe term limits because they thought, you know what, American people have a chance and they have an impact. Unfortunately, since founders' fathers thought through all of these processes, a lot of negative things happened. They never thought about 16th and 17th Amendment, where now a lot of senators don't even remember where the state, their states are located, or maybe don't have capacity to remember, or how much money is spent now in D.C., and how much money go on political packs, and how expensive this election became. So I think considering the amount of money that invested in these races, I think have shorter term limits is actually would be better because that this big special interest group wouldn't be as much interested to spend money and actually maybe some person, good American with good intent would be able to win in some of these races. Not only people have that able to raise money and have their own money. I think this has become a huge problem. And don't worry, guys, you're still going to get all your pensions even in six years. So you'll be all good set to go, which is ridiculous thing that we even have in pensions. This is actually a duty, not a, you know, it's a service. It's like a tour of duty. So I think it's good. And another thing I would like to add, you know, honestly, this job is a hard job and it's meant to be hard. And you know what, you know, the longer you stay here, I think you have the two things. You become part of the swamp or you completely give up. So I think you have as a human being so much time and energy to do. So I think, you know, you learn your first term, you make some move, but you know what, if you cannot accomplish something in six years, probably let someone else to try it. 
Otherwise, we become run here by young kids and some of them great kids. But you know what? If we run here by 25-year-olds that never had real life and some people that have been there all their life that also don't understand what real life is, we're going to be real in trouble, and we are. So I think, actually, this is something that we have to highly consider. I think fresh ideas. We have many Americans, millions of Americans that could represent here fresh ideas, fresh energy, fresh deliberation would be actually very healthy for this institution that it's not run a top-down approach, but not run by big money, but actually we will be represented with the people and people don't have to worry about as much about the next race, but worry more how we're going to save this republic because a lot of issues here that we're deliberating shouldn't be a partisan issue because we have, there are some issues that will be very, you know, disagree, disagree very much and debate very, very vibrantly. But there are some issues like national security issues, like border security, that, that we shouldn't have deliberation. We should actually start governing. So maybe people will not be afraid to stand up against the very powerful money machine and say, you know what, I'll do the right thing regardless of consequences and we'll save this republic and protect these people. We have many Americans died for our freedoms and have this greatest experiment that ever existed in history of the world. And we have to remember, not just talk about it. I had one of the actually, our active military guys sent me a very interesting note that he did for memorial service of his fallen brother in Afghanistan. And he, it was very impactful for me when he said, you know, it's not just words and tributes and all this different presentation we do, but how do we carry on with actions and our flag of freedom and our ideas and ideals forward and stand up and fight for these issues and not being afraid. Big money machine pushing on us, status quo pushing on us, being well enough, you know, being able to challenge our own party. It's very easy to blame the other side and do presentations and circuses here, very easy, you know, but actually challenge your own party and say, you know what? My party need to get up and do and put the money where mouse is because we are betraying the American people. We're betraying a lot of heroes and doing a lot of presentation for the social media here where the country has some serious issues. And we might not agree on all of them, but we can find common ground if we want. So I think this legislation maybe help us to get stronger, grow backbone and stamina and actually start serving the people that we're meant to be. Because as I said, there is no lobby for the people here. We're the only people lobby for the people. And if we fail, our republic is going to fail and I'm not ready to give up. So I urge my colleagues to support. Okay. And, but not to oppose this amendment and support this bill. The gentlelady's time has expired. Is there further discussion? I'll recognize myself for five minutes. I, I uh, confess I'm a, a reformed drunk on this subject. Um, I was one of just two sitting members of the California Assembly to endorse legislative term limits in 1990. <clears throat> uh, they set a six-year uh, limit on the Assembly, and I supported them for the, for the same reasons we've heard from the advocates today. I genuinely thought it would encourage more goal-oriented membership who, uh, who were more skeptical of the bureaucracy uh, and, and were more independent from legislative leaders. Um, and uh, I, I won all of my debates just by saying, whatever the opposition says, just take a look at the California state legislature and tell me, could things possibly get any worse? And we all laughed and we all voted for term limits and as karma would have it, I left the assembly in 1992 when the term limits had had no practical effect yet on the membership, and I returned four years later when they had had complete and total effect. And, and the differences that I observed were absolutely jarring. Uh, they achieved the opposite of their intended effect. I, instead of arriving in the legislature contemplating their, their political mortality, members simply arrived contemplating their next political move. Um, they had no experience in state government, so they were far more dependent on the bureaucracy. And since their terms were limited, they were far more dependent on the leadership to assist in their next political move. Prior to term limits, members on the committees often had more experience with the subject matter than the bureaucrats who were appearing before them. A term limit stripped the legislative branch of this advantage and it shifted enormous influence from the elected legislature 
to the unelected professional bureaucracy. Uh, before term limits, there was a sense of loyalty to the institution and the process. Term limits destroyed all of that. Uh, before term limits, the, the, the assembly had leaders with experience that was commensurate to the Senate, and the houses were fairly evenly balanced in terms of their influence. The leaders of the assembly had equal or greater experience as their Senate counterparts, but after term limits, the Senate become the, became the dominant house because that's where all of the experience accumulated. Uh, you know, some say the founders envisioned citizen politicians and term limits will restore that vision. Well, the founders served in many different offices and walks of life, but, but they were very serious politicians. Uh, George Washington won his first political office to the Virginia House of Burgess at age 26. He left the presidency at 65. That's a career that spanned 39 years. John Adams was first elected as selectman of the town of Braintree, Massachusetts at age 31. He left the presidency in 1801 at age 66. That career spanned 35 years. Thomas Jefferson was 26 when he was first elected to the Virginia House of Burgess. He left the presidency in 1809 at the age of 64, 38 years. James Madison, first elected to the Virginia legislature when he was 25, left the presidency in 1817 at the age of 66, 41 years. Abraham Lincoln was 25 when he was first elected to the Illinois House of Representatives after he lost his first bid at age 23. He left the presidency at 1865 at age 56, total career 31 years. So I pose this question. Would the country have been better off if we had curtailed these professional politicians just when they were acquiring the wisdom and judgment and experience to guide our, our nation through times of strife and peril? Term limit advocates dwell on the advantages of incumbency. Incumbents do have an advantage over challengers because they've already been through the vetting process with their constituents. They've generally acquired a greater experience in the subjects that they've dealt with, and they've built a record that people can judge. The founders did limit term li terms in a way. They limited the House to two-year terms to assure that by definition, the House was constantly representative of the people. And I'd argue those are all good things that we should encourage. If my conservative colleagues, who mistakenly believe that term limits will improve the legislative branch, please, please look to states like California that succumbed to that siren song and ask yourself if you really want to send the Congress in that direction. Please, please look to the debate over this very issue at the Constitutional Convention and understand the reason these wise men rejected the idea. They did so according to Madison's notes, principally for the reason the ranking member mentioned, that as term limits approached, they were afraid members would consider less and less the public interest and more and more their own. That's just human nature. In short, we have based our entire form of government on the assumption that more than half the people are right more than half of the time. That's a sound assumption. Let's, let's stick to it and let us trust the people. And I yield back. And um, if there's no further discussion, if there's no further discussion, uh, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Nails. Uh, those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. No. The ayes appear to have it. Roll call. Roll call is requested. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes aye. Mr. Van Drew. Yes. Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels. Yes. Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Moore. No. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Aye. Mr. Kiley votes aye. Ms. Hageman. Aye. Ms. Hageman votes aye. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. No. 
Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Yes. Uh, no. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes no. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes no. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. No. Mr. Ivey votes no. Ms. Ballant. Ms. Ballant votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana, you are not recorded. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes yes. Uh, Mr. Fry, you're not recorded. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Klein? I vote yes. Mr. Klein votes yes. House Massey recorded? Mr. Massey, you're not recorded. Massey votes aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Are there any other members? Are there any other members uh, who wish to be recorded? Mr. Jordan. Mr. Liu, you are not recorded. Mr. Liu votes no. Are there any other members who wish to be recorded? Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Seeing no other uh, members seeking to vote, uh, the uh, 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 clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 11 ayes and 21 noes. Well, the noes have it and the amendment is not agreed to. A reporting quorum being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the chair will call for a roll call. The uh, <laughs> clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Isa, Mr. Buck, Mr. Gates. Aye for term limits. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs, Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany, Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey, Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop? Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Sparts? Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Bentz? Mr. Bentz votes yes. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden? Mr. Gooden votes aye. Mr. Van Drew? Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels? Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Moore? Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley? Aye. Mr. Kiley votes aye. Ms. Hageman? No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran? Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt? Mr. Fry? Aye. Mr. Fry votes aye. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? Mr. Cohen? 
Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Schiff votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Mr. Liu votes no. Ms. Jayapal? Mr. Correa? Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Nagoose? Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. Dean? Ms. Escobar? Ms. Escobar votes no. Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? Mr. Ivey votes no. Ms. Ballant? Ms. Ballant votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Swallow, you're not recorded. Mr. Swallow votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee, you are not recorded. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Issa, you are not recorded. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Are there any other members who wish to vote? Clerk will report the roll. Mr. Chairman, there are 17 ayes and 19 noes. Vote being 17 in the affirmative and 19 in the negative. Uh, this does not constitute a majority and the bill is not agreed to. Uh, the, uh, without objection. Uh, Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 2553, the No More Political Prosecutions Act, for purposes of markup and move that the committee report it favorably to the House. Kirk will report the bill. H.R. 2553 to amend Title 28, United States Code, to authorize removal Without of Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. 
The chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Fry, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 2553, the No More Political Prosecutions Act, would place a check on radical left-wing prosecutors. Mr. Chairman, can I get some Mr. Order? Chairman, the committee's not in order. Gentlemen's points well taken. Committee will come to order. Gentlemen, proceed. The No More Political Prosecutions Act would place a check on radical left-wing prosecutors' ability to bring politically motivated criminal cases before judges and juries. The last few months have brought about some of the most insane, reckless, and unprecedented moves from rogue prosecutors to target one of our nation's top political leaders for their own gain. For the first time in American history, a former president has been indicted and faced with criminal charges. And these two indictments have come from district attorneys, state elected district attorneys looking to build up their profile. They fundraise off of it, they campaign on it, and make a name for themselves or try to make a name for themselves on a national stage. In April, the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg announced multiple felony indictments against President Trump. And then in August, Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis did the same thing. Days before indicting President Trump, Fannie Willis launches conveniently a re-election fundraising website. And days after Bragg indicted Trump, Democrat Congressman Dan Goldman takes the opportunity to hold a fundraiser with Alvin Bragg. Willis and Bragg were on a mission to get national attention. They campaigned on it and find creative ways to target President Trump for re-election. Willis even told the news outlet, we've been working on this for two and a half years. We're ready to go. They could have brought charges a while ago, I guess, or at any time, but they decided to do it as soon as he launches his re-election campaign. These district attorneys are doing everything they can to keep Donald Trump out of the White House and prosecute him out. The American people see through these antics. According to a recent CBS poll in August, most Americans think that these indictments are purely an effort to derail his campaign. President Trump is a former president of the United States, our former commander-in-chief. He was the leader of the free world. A small town prosecutor or a state district attorney should not have the ability to attack former presidents of the United States. We don't do this in America. In fact, this is our first time that this has ever happened. You know who does this? Third world despots. We can't allow America to turn into a country where candidates running for office are prosecuted solely because of their po politics. These radical prosecutors have weaponized our justice system against its political opponents, and Congress has a duty to respond. The No More Political Prosecutions Act would give presidents and vice presidents, both former and current, the option, not the requirement, but the option that they could move their civil or criminal case from state court to federal court. The federal interests implicated by civil actions or criminal prosecutions brought against these individuals are overwhelming. Therefore, federal, the federal court is an appropriate form to adjudicate any such case with so, such a strong federal nexus. Federal judges enjoy life tenure as opposed to state, uh, state judges who are often elected or appointed directly. By contrast, uh, or also, federal courts enjoy a jury pool that is often drawn from a larger, more diverse crowd, and the information about a jury pool is much more robust than in state courts. This helps ensure that political biases of one political locality do not improperly influence the jury and its decisions. We must ensure that state courts are not weaponized against current and former presidents or vice presidents. This is simply common sense. We can and should act to provide this option of a fair playing field for legal proceedings for all presidents and vice presidents, both former and current. I urge my colleagues to support this and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the legislative arm of Donald Trump's presidential campaign and legal defense fund is at it again. The Republican Party won its slim majority by promising to focus on economic issues. But instead of focusing on uh, America, I'm sorry, but instead of, pro instead of protecting American wallets or even keeping our government open, the extreme MAGA Republicans on this committee are spending yet more time and yet more taxpayer money looking out for the one American they care about more than any other, Donald Trump. One of the primary responsibilities of the House Judiciary Committee is to protect the rule of law. Yet this Congress, we have seen the majority repeatedly use the power of this committee to subvert the rule of law instead. Members of this committee have, at the express request of the former president's lawyers, attempted to undermine prosecutors in my home state of New York and interfere with the state prosecution of Donald Trump. But the majority did not stop there. When Donald Trump's Florida resort, Mar-a-Lago, was, was searched by federal agents, 
who had a lawfully obtained warrant and probable cause, Republicans on this committee threatened to defund the FBI and publicly denigrated the men and women who keep us safe. And yesterday, the chairman sent yet another letter to Fulton County DA Fannie Willis, continuing his efforts to bully her into dropping her case against Donald Trump. The more that Donald Trump faces legal peril, his current counts stands at a staggering 91 criminal charges in four courts, courts across the country, not to mention judgments against him in two civil cases in recent months, the more this committee puts all other work aside to rush to his defense. Yet even by the low standards of this majority, the bill we are considering today is egregious. The legislation before us would benefit just one person, Donald Trump. How do we know this? Well, it would remove from any state court case Against the, former, uh, against the current or former president from state to federal court. There is only one current or former president in history that a grand jury has found probable cause to indict for multiple state crimes, and that is Donald Trump. The Constitution guarantees American citizens the right to trial by a jury of their peers. And under our laws, victims of crime have the right to seek justice in the community where that crime occurs. The so-called No More Political Prosecutions Act or more accurately, the Donald J. Trump Relief Act, would deprive states of this basic right to bring cases in their courts when their citizens are harmed. A jury has found that Donald Trump raped a citizen of New York State. Grand juries have found that he defrauded taxpayers in New York and that he engaged in an organized criminal conspiracy to steal an election in Georgia. Donald Trump deserves his day in court, or given the number of federal and state criminal indictments against him, his days in court. But like anyone else who has been indicted for committing a state crime, he should be tried in state court. The only purpose of this bill is the perceived advantage his sponsors believe it would provide to Donald Trump, such as broader jury pools, different judges, and different procedural rules. It is the same tort reform playbook that Republicans use to protect wealthy corporations from being held accountable in state courts, except this time it is being used to protect one wealthy man or at least one man who claims to be wealthy. It is also an attempt to undermine a bedrock principle of our democracy, that the powers of the presidency belong to the office, not to the person who holds it. Ex-presidents are citizens with all the same legal rights and protections and the same ability to be held accountable for their actions as any other citizen. This bill, if passed, would put an end to that proud history. This bill is as desperate as it is dangerous. A jury has already found Donald Trump liable for rape. Grand juries have indicted him for multiple counts of business fraud and for running an organized criminal conspiracy trying to steal the 2020 election by depriving American citizens of their right to have their votes counted. Abusing this committee, abusing this committee's authority to put a thumb on the scale of any legal proceeding is wrong. Doing so in this case is also particularly telling. It's not something you do if you think Donald Trump can win his many civil and criminal cases on the merits. It's only something you do when all else has failed, when you think that Donald Trump is going to jail unless you intervene on his behalf. For years, MAGA Republicans have condoned and at times have even encouraged violence against election officials. They've spread wild, dangerous, baseless conspiracy theories. They've abandoned the bedrock American principle that we are all equal in the eyes of the law all in the service of one man and his never-ending presidential campaign. As we have seen so often, when Trump says jump, MAGA Republicans say, how high? So I asked the chairman, can we spend a little more time trying to improve the lives of families in our districts and a little less time trying to help one Florida man's presidential campaign and his desperate attempts to evade accountability? The government is about to shut down. Seniors on Social Security are wondering if their checks will be delayed. Working families who rely on food stamps to supplement their income are wondering if their children will go hungry. These are the Americans who need our help, not Donald Trump. I strongly oppose this legislation. I encourage all my colleagues to do the same, and I yield back the balance of my time. General yields back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. The cha uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Fry for the purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Calling Mr. Fry. <coughs> 
Well, in Mr. Fry's absence, we will simply uh, open up the bill for discussion. Oh. Oh. Chair recognizes Mr. Klein for the right. purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the desk. Nature of a the substitute. Amendment. amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2553 offered by Mr. Klein of Virginia. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute be considered as read and shall be considered base text for purposes of amendment. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein, to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment makes a small change to the title. <laughs> specifying that this is a 2023 bill and does not change the underlying text. I yield back. Is there any discussion on the amendment in the nature of a substitute? This already says 2023. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohn. Thank you, sir. I'm going to deliver some remarks here, but I don't know that they'll do any good. I haven't heard remarks as pertinent and as well addressed as Mr. McClintock's on the term limits bill, and it didn't affect a single vote on the other side. Uh, and that was uh, unfortunate. But uh, the Constitution, first I'd like to have, Mr. McClintock, Mr. Chairman, can I have the Constitution entered into the record as a, as a document? To Without objection. Thank you. And we just took a pledge when we started today to support the Constitution. The Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, lays out the judicial powers of the federal courts, and it nowhere would allow for such a bill as this to occur. The judicial power extends to cases arising under this Constitution, the laws of the states and treaties, to all cases affecting ambassadors, public ministers, and councils, not presidents, to all cases of admiralty and maritime, to controversies which the United States may be a party, controversies between two or more states, between citizens in a state of another state, citizens of different states, citizens of the same state claiming lands, and between a state or citizen thereof and foreign states, citizens or subjects. There is no constitutional basis for this law. It is unconstitutional, and we took an oath to support the Constitution. We pledged allegiance and all that other stuff we do. But it's all wind addressing because all this is about Donald Trump. I pledge allegiance to Donald Trump the former President of the United States, the twice indicted President of the United States, the four times, twice impeached President of the United States, four times indicted President of the United States. That's who they pledge allegiance to. The idea that the lady who was raped at Bergdorf Goodman would have to take her case to federal court because a man who wasn't president at the time took her into a dressing room at Bergdorf Goodman and forced himself upon her is a disgrace to this country, to this committee, to every woman in, the, in, in, this, in this nation. They would have to take their case to federal court. There's a likelihood or a possibility that the president will have recommended that judge. The president is fond of saying Trump judges and other judges. State courts, you don't have that situation. And appeals would go to the Supreme Court, which is Trump likes to think of it as his Supreme Court. Well, the Supreme Court has been independent on some of his cases before, and they may continue to be. Let's hope so. But he certainly doesn't think they should be or would be. The idea of these cases are taken to have to be taken to federal court because of Donald Trump. Mr. Fry says in all our history, there's never been a time this has happened. Mr. Fry's not here. I don't think he was necessarily a student of history. But in all of our history, there's never been anybody nearly as corrupt, as venal, and as avaricious as Donald Trump, who lies about the values of his real estate to get better deals with the banks, who tries to say, I only need to find me 11,135 votes, just one more than I have. Gets on the telephone and does that, calls Georgia says the documents that are classified that he has at Mar-a-Lago are his documents. He can do what he wants with them. They're his. There's never been a president like him anywhere, not in fiction or in fact. 
Nobody could even conjure up such an awful human being being president of the United States. Mm -hmm. And he was. But now you're going to give him courts of jurisdiction where he gets an advantage? Let's get real. Let's remember we represent the rule of law, fairness, and justice. Most folks think that the state courts are the better courts or closest to the people. A lot of people say, we don't need the federal government. We don't need to take federal education monies. Our states should do education. We don't need the strings that the federal, you know, in the courts, you think you'd want the courts to have jurisdiction of the cases that happen in their area and the judges that might be elected and have a certain duty to their, to their position and not appointed. I think most people think that way. Anyway, regardless of that, Mr. McClintock, you were fantastic. I'm afraid it fell on deaf ears or deaf minds? Probably, probably minds. on both sides. <laughs> and I, yield, I just ask that we get rid of this rubbish. The gentleman back. yields back. Is there further discussion? Yes. Ms. Jackson Lee. Yes. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized. And I rise in opposition to, uh, to this bill. This is another desperate attempt by MAGA extremist Republicans to place Donald Trump above the law. And um, what they're trying to do is to defeat uh, Fannie Willis, uh, the Fulton County prosecutor, who actually uh, I think is more like a David versus Goliath situation. And I'll call Fannie. Uh, Davida. Uh, it's a Davida versus uh, Goliath situation. Goliath, and of course this story, David versus Goliath, is a biblical story that had as its uh, true meaning uh, the triumph of uh, God over lesser deities. But in modern times, uh, this battle uh, between uh, David and Goliath, or in this instance, Davida versus Goliath, has to do with the powerful versus those who are less powerful. And the fact that truth wins out. We've seen so many examples of David versus Goliath uh, throughout the course of human history, where it appears that the strong, those with uh, 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 an ex-president for instance, uh, with a national cult following that will rise up and do his bidding, will even try to overthrow the government on his behalf and will continue uh, after the overthrow was unsuccessful to perpetrate lies and deceit uh, on the public. Uh, that's what Goliaths do. They rely on lesser deities. And so this is a story about uh, a woman, a local prosecutor, using her power, entrusted to her by the people who elected her, uh, to carry forth justice, because an injustice was done within her jurisdiction. And she's just simply using the law uh, to bring about justice where justice is due. And my prediction, ladies and gentlemen, is that justice will prevail. Truth will win out under, over lesser deities uh, in this case. So I applaud uh, Fannie Willis for what she has done, but she's under attack by Goliath. Goliath uh, is uh, Donald Trump and the Insurrection Protection Committee, which used to be known as the Judiciary Committee, none other than this very committee that we're sitting on, taking up this legislation to try to um, insulate uh, its God, Donald Trump, uh, from being held accountable under the law, under state law. And so I would ask my colleagues to uh, be respectful of state authority States have laws. Law enforcement in states needs to be accomplished. Prosecutions need to move forward and let the facts 
let the facts be introduced in court and let the jurors decide. Uh, that's what's happening in Fulton County. That's how justice works. We do, we do not need to derail justice just to protect the king. We don't have kings in this country. Every person is equal and nobody is above the law. And so that's why this legislation should fail. Why should we have a carve out for a former president who is under indictment, not just locally and in state prosecutions, but also in two federal prosecutions facing uh, 91, 92, 93 particular counts of wrongdoing. Um, let's let justice prevail and let's not pass this legislation. Let's vote no on this legislation which sets up one person, a Goliath, as a king in this country. That's wrong. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Jackson Lee. Gentlelady's recognized. I'm very glad, uh, first of all, that uh, the ranking member of the Constitution Subcommittee placed into the record and maybe uh, every quarter we should replace or place the Constitution uh, into the record so that it is timely for each quarter that we're here. Um, it, it is always um, challenging to use historical perspective to say as long as I've been in this Congress and it's been some years, I've never seen legislation like this in my entire life. Uh, and there certainly have been uh, incidences um, in past years that might have warranted some form of removal by a federal officer, which the President of the United States is. But this is the first time I've seen it. The amendment has uh, been filed, and there are about 10 co-sponsors. I don't know if the author is in the room at this time. But certainly members have the right and opportunity to file legislation. The dominance of one person is the shocking value of this legislation. That it seems to turn specifically not on a constitutional right, but it seems to turn on my whim, my anger, and I just don't want to be in that state court in New York or in Georgia. It doesn't matter the merits of my case. It doesn't matter that I'll still be awarded constitutional rights of equal protection under the law, due process. All of these will be given to the defendant in a state court. The Constitution's doors or it, it, its power does not stop at the front door of the court of a particular state. You have your constitutional rights. So the argument cannot be that it, the case needs to be moved on behalf of the former president, which this bill should be the former president's relief act. It's not that uh, he is going to be denied uh, his rights of uh, defense all of that will inure to him in state courts across the nation. And I think we already have an, an indication of what might happen because when he attempted uh, to move the case in the Alvin Bragg case in New York, a federal court uh, on May 4th, 2023, uh, the former president, President Trump, moved to have his state case removed to federal court on the grounds that it related to conduct, conduct he engaged in while president. On July 19th, federal judge Alvin K. Hellerstein um, filed or ruled that the case would not be removed, stating hush money paid to an adult film star is not related to a president's official acts. Now, if you look at the landscape of facts of the district attorney uh, in uh, Fulton County, I believe, Mr. Johnson, uh, those matters arguably in a federal court might also be questioned as to whether or not trying to throw an election, uh, trying to intimidate innocent election workers, trying to find 11,000 more votes, and can you find them for me, uh, intimidating uh, official officers of the election process may not be considered 
part of one's official duties of the commander in chief and being the president of the United States on behalf of the American people. Uh, meaning that your duties and the words and acts and deeds are all geared towards serving the vast constituents of over 300 million people. So I guess, uh, Mr. Chairman, so many of us on this side are in such awe and shock, shock and awe, that we are just at a loss as to how we, uh, one, uh, have this on markup, uh, I know all of us can offer our own legislation, so just for a moment, uh, indulge me to say that I would really like to see H.R. 30, um, which deals with the massive epidemic of sex trafficking and human trafficking, which is bipartisan legislation. And I know that you would join me, Mr. McClintock, you have been a fighter against these issues or for these issues, um, could be moving, and other members have very important initiatives that they would like to see moving on both sides of the aisle. So I guess my um, conclusory remarks as I finish, what is the rush? What is the substance of this legislation? And what is the constitutional, my friend, Mr. Cohen already read from Article 3, what is the constitutional premise of the legislation? I'd ask my colleagues to consider this and oppose uh, the underlying legislation. I yield back. time has expired. Is there further discussion? Mr. Schiff. Oh. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. I reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. General reserves a point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2553, offered by Mr. Schiff, page 1, line 11, insert after, quote, or vice president, the following, quote, except in the case of a civil action. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from California to explain his amendment for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I turn to the contents of the amendment, let's just recall the history here. Donald Trump is indicted in New York in connection with hush money payment checks he wrote to a porn star and alleged fraud to conceal those hush money payment checks. Now, I remember a Republican Party leadership that used to pride itself on standing for family values. But here, the reaction to the indictment of Donald Trump was not to declaim the former president's actions, not to articulate anything to do with family values, except to say, I suppose, the family values no, matter, no longer matter to the GOP, and they certainly don't matter in the case of the party leader. Next, Donald Trump is, in, Donald Trump is indicted over the deliberate retention of classified documents uh, in an insecure location in a public club at Mar-a-Lago in a bathroom, near a ballroom. Um, and I remember Republican Party leadership that used to profess to be champions of national security and the protection of classified information. I remember a Republican Party that took such enormous uh, uh, issue with Hillary Clinton's unintentional uh, inclusion of classified material in emails. But here we have the deliberate retention uh, and potential obstruction of an investigation into it by Donald Trump and the reaction from the Republican Party leadership is, well, that's just fine with us. Next, Donald Trump is indicted for conspiracy to defraud the United States, voters of the United States, to defraud the people of Georgia for his role in an election subversion scheme that resulted in a violent attack on the Capitol on the beating and gouging of police officers and I remember a Republican Party that used to claim to stand for democracy and law to order and used to uh, profess its support for the police. And what is their response? Their response is, that's just fine with us if it's the leader of our party. And instead of condemning the actions of the former president, they condemn the actions of, the, of law enforcement and the FBI and defend the indefensible. And now this committee wants to use its power to do criminal discovery for Donald Trump, to become effectively the criminal defense firm for Donald Trump and subpoena records from these prosecutorial authorities to aid uh, in the former president's defense. And more than that, we now have this bill 
It's not enough to do criminal discovery for the former president. No, we want to remove these cases from federal court or we want to remove them from state courts and move them to federal court wherever we can get the most favorable venue for the leader of our party. This committee has turned itself into nothing less than a defense shill for the former president. I remember a Republican Party that would have decried the violations of the Constitution and the law that we have seen of the former president, that would have defended the courts and our justice system, that would have said that we look forward to the prosecution proving its case beyond a reasonable doubt in court. I remember a Republican Party that used to be a party of ideology, a conservative ideology. And I look forward to the day when once again it becomes a party of ideology, really any ideology would do, instead of this kind of cult of the former president. But until that time, it's going to fall on the rest of us to continue to defend our democracy, our justice system, our court system, the rule of law, the proposition that no one is above the law. Donald Trump is not above the law. You continue to do everything in your power to prevent the law from applying to one person. And this is just the latest iteration. This amendment would, would simply exclude from this removal provision circumstances in which someone tries to subvert an election. Pretty narrow amendment. But here, the goal, sadly, is to subvert the election process, to defend someone who engages in efforts to overturn the election. Because here the effort is to defend someone for the purposes of obtaining power and keeping power, notwithstanding the votes of the American people. But I urge support for this amendment, and I urge opposition to this deeply ill-considered bill, and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman withdraw my point of order. The chairman withdraws his point of order. Further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lofgren. Uh, thank you. I moved to strike the last word. I will uh, support Mr. Schiff's amendment, uh, but I would note that there's already ample protection uh, in the code for causes of action that are mischievous, for lack of a better word. 28 U.S. Code 1442 provides that the uh, protection when an officer of the United States uh, is acting under color of, of law. And the court has found in the cases of Mr. Trump that you know, subverting the election is not part of the scope of duty of the President of the United States. I'd note further that uh, defrauding in your business activities is also not within uh, the job description of the President of the United States. Uh, defaming uh, someone who you have um, sexually harassed is also not within uh, the scope of the duties of, the, of a President of the United States. So while the, uh, Mr. Schiff's amendment is warranted, I would note that the underlying statute provides ample protection for anything that would be mischievous. I don't know if Mr. Schiff would like additional time. I would be happy to yield to him if so. Otherwise, I would uh, yield back, noting that while I support this amendment, really the underlying law provides all the protection that is necessary. And I really do think it's disappointing that this committee will give the impression to the world that we've become part of the Trump defense team, frankly, and it's not the role that we should play. I yield back. General Lee yields back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nadler. Move to strike the last word. General Ray. Mr. Chairman, I support this amendment. It would create an exception to the legislation for causes of action related to election subversion. State prosecutors must not be stripped of their ability to hold accountable those who seek to undermine and disenfranchise uh, voters in their states. But let there be no illusions about the timing of this bill or the purpose of this bill. Last month, Donald Trump and his associates were indicted on 41 felony criminal charges in Georgia for racketeering, fraud, and conspiracy. 
all with the goal of stealing votes in Georgia that had gone to Joe Biden. This bill is the Republicans' attempt to wave a magic wand and make that criminal attempt to overthrow an election disappear. Donald Trump has made it clear he doesn't care about the democratic process or American voters. He certainly didn't respect Americans in Georgia when he told Georgia's Secretary of State to, quote, find votes for Trump to overturn Biden's victory there. Now, after stomping all over the people of Georgia, he doesn't want to face them in court. And the Republicans want to make sure he never does. That's what this bill is about. State laws aren't written for fun. But the Republicans want to make state laws just a suggestion for Donald Trump, not a law. That's not how this works. Our country depends on each and every state to administer safe, secure, and fair elections. We should all be extremely concerned that the Republicans are trying to gut states' ability to protect their voters. This bill is a slap in the face to every poll worker, every election official, and every voter who believes and participates in our democratic process. Let's be clear about what the Republicans want to excuse. 22 counts related to forgery and false documents and statements. Eight counts related to soliciting or impersonating public officers. Three counts relating to influencing witnesses. Three counts related to election fraud or defrauding the state. Three counts related to computer tampering. One count related to perjury and one count related to racketeering. These are serious violations and the Republicans should be ashamed of this naked attempt to minimize them. Just last month, a federal grand jury indicted Donald Trump on four counts related to his attempts to over a federal grand jury indicted Donald Trump on four counts related to his attempts to overturn the 2020 election and incite the riot of January 6th. Today, the Republicans are co-signing his behavior and laying down a red carpet for him to return to do more. Our job as legislators isn't about writing get out of jail free cards for our favorite elected officials especially when those people are trying to subvert the rights and will of the American people who we swore an oath to represent. It's shameful that this is how the Republicans want us to spend the day, when we are only 72 hours from a government shutdown that will keep millions of Americans from food stamps, paychecks, and critical services. But instead of facing the real problems, keeping Americans up at night, they're just trying to prevent Trump from having to face the consequences of his criminal actions. As members of Congress, it is our duty to serve the American people. So I want to ask my Republican colleagues, who are you serving? Is it the American people or just your chosen leader? Chairman yields back. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the uh, question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The no's appear to have it. A uh, gentleman from New York requests a uh, roll call. Um, clerk will uh, call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Ms. Hageman. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. No. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Aye. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. 
Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Liu? Ms. Jayapal? Mm -hmm. Mr. Correa? Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon? Mr. Nagus? Ms. McBath? Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar? Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? Ms. Ballant? Ms. Ballant votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa? Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. Gates votes no. Ms. Sparts, you're not recorded. Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Nagus, you are not recorded. Mr. Nagus votes yes. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana, you are not recorded. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Uh, have any other uh, members not recorded their vote and wish to? Uh, seeing none, uh, the uh, clerk will report the roll call. Mr. Chairman, there are 11 ayes and 12 noes. 11 ayes and 12 noes, the uh, amendment is not agreed to. Uh, is there further discussion on the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of uh, Georgia. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2553 offered by Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Page one. Without line. objection, the amendment will uh, deemed uh, to be read. Uh, okay. Chair Rick. The general lady from Indiana order. reserves a point of order. The gentleman is recognized uh, for five minutes to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment would prevent this bill from being applied to pending cases so that it would apply only to future cases. Once again, uh, welcome to the congressional arm of the Trump reelection campaign. Since taking the gavel, MAGA Republicans have repeatedly attacked anyone who tries to hold Trump accountable, whether that's investigators, prosecutors, law enforcement agents, or even the attorney general. So they, they roll from state to federal. Uh, nothing is exempt. But in places like my home state of Georgia, grand juries and courts are still standing up for justice. So MAGA extremist Republicans have moved on to a new strategy, trying to pass legislation that would prevent those state and local governments from prosecuting crimes which occurred in their jurisdictions, but only insofar as one individual is concerned, and that is their fearless leader, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Trump is already facing 34 felony charges in New York State, 13 felony charges in Georgia, and has pending civil cases that don't seem to be going too well in Colorado and New York. Trump tried to have his case 
his Georgia case removed from state court, but a judge already denied that request. So enter House Judiciary Republicans. Their bill to remove current and future state cases against a former president can only serve one purpose, and that is to protect the only president to ever be indicted in American history, Donald Trump, to protect him from the consequences of his actions. It's wrong what the Insurrection Protection Committee is trying to do. Uh, we should vote uh, this amendment up. In other words, yes, vote on this amendment. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I will yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, I was through the point of order. Move to strike the last word. Gentlemen's recognized. Welcome back to Insurrection LLP, where just hours before the government is to shut down and troops will not be paid, border agents will not be paid, FBI agents will not be paid, air traffic controllers will not be paid, uh, we are convening uh, to make sure that the former president uh, has a special lane in the criminal justice system. And, and that's been the theme of this entire Congress at the expense of the rest of the country and keeping kids safe in their schools, making sure that Americans can vote and have their vote counted, that this committee would focus entirely on one client, the former president. That's batty, that's nuts. I don't think history will judge it well that that's the obsession that these folks have. But the real cost right now, if you were to go home and talk to one of your constituents, if you were to talk to somebody other than Donald Trump, my guess is they're gonna tell you that they want you to keep the government working for them. They don't want their social security benefits, their Medicare benefits. They don't want a single benefit that they have paid into to be put at risk because all you can do is Donald Trump's legal work in this committee. I, I think it would just be seen as a little tone deaf if they were to know that that is where your focus is right now. But I wanna just kinda of lay out where we're headed. In fewer than 100 hours, an FBI agent who is supposed to be investigating a terrorism case is not going to be paid. A soldier assigned overseas away from their family is not going to be paid. A border agent charged with keeping us secure is not going to be paid. An air traffic controller tasked with making sure that planes don't crash and land safely is not going to be paid. Millions of Americans are going to have their paychecks suspended. And what is happening in the Judiciary Committee right now? You're focused on one person, Donald Trump. I'd argue that you're actually focused on the jobs of two people, Donald Trump and Speaker McCarthy. Speaker McCarthy won't put forward a bill that will pass a majority of the members of this body, similar to what's passed an overwhelming majority in the Senate because he's worried about his job at the cost of millions of Americans' jobs. And you won't focus on anything but Donald Trump because you wanna make sure that he gets back into office. It's a shame. Most Americans would say, if you're focused on Donald Trump, you're not focused on me. If you're focused on keeping your job as speaker, you're not focused on me. And this is a committee, as I said, that has dedicated itself entirely to one person. So I will oppose the overall bill. I thank the gentleman from Georgia uh, for his thoughtful amendment, which I will support. And again, the government is going to shut down. And it's important that the American people know that these folks are shutting it down to protect Donald Trump. They are the failures. They have failed to govern, so they have failed to fund. And because they've failed to fund, they have failed to protect. They won't pay the troops, they won't pay the cops, and they won't secure the border. But Donald Trump is gonna get a full day in the Judiciary Committee. I yield back.
Is there further discussion? Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 uh, I'm going to support the amendment. With respect to the underlying bill, I, I wanted to raise specific issues because I, I think the amendment um, is ineffective, frankly. I, I, it may misunderstand what the, the current statute actually does, or, or maybe I do. But as I read 1442, it's got a section one, which covers any agency or any officer or any person acting under that office of the United States of, or any agency in an official or individual capacity, et cetera. So that covers everybody other than, in paragraph three, it speaks to the courts, so that covers the judges. Paragraph four covers us, either House or the Congress. Paragraph two covers property holders. So the three branches of government are already covered in the current statute. So adding a paragraph five, which speaks to president, vice president, is not only redundant, but also misguided in part because it leaves out the, the official capacity part. Now maybe that was the intent of this amendment to make sure that um, the president or vice president could remove a case from state court to federal court, even if they weren't acting in their individual capacity. But that strikes me as essentially illegal because the federal courts would have no basis for jurisdiction over the case. So if you've got a case where the charges are in state court because they're state law, and you've got the president and the vice president not acting in their official capacity as federal officials, but just regular citizens, there's no nexus to the federal court or the federal law. And so it strikes me as unreasonable to try and make this change. And with respect to that issue, um, and I, you know, I would refer to the, the, the case, uh, the, the opinion that was rendered in the Meadows decision, because Mark Meadows moved to have his case removed to federal court. Um, so point one, the president could, uh, President Trump or Pence, they could move to have their cases removed to federal court under current law. That might not be granted. It might be granted, but it's covered by federal by, by current law. But as uh, just to quote Justice Scalia, and I don't do it often, the point is only that the officer should have to identify as the gravamen of the suit and act, an act that was, if not required by, at least closely connected with the performance of his official duties. In other words, even under uh, you know the based on the Supreme Court reviewing these sorts of scenarios, they're always looking for a federal nexus before they try and move a case from state court to federal court. I think that's the right way to go. It strikes me as, yeah, probably illegal, but certainly unreasonable to have a case move from state court to federal court where there's no federal statute that's involved, there's no federal act that's involved, um, and there's no sense that or, you know, scenario where only the federal court could resolve the issue in a way that a state court couldn't, and you don't have a diversity of jurisdiction issue. So there's no, there's really no legal basis for doing this. Uh, and, you know, I'll close with this. It's uh, inexplicable beyond an effort to try and help out President Trump, I guess, uh, because there's no other reason to do it since it's already covered in the current law. And so I, I you know, Note Mr. Swalwell's points. I, I don't really think it's important for us or relevant for us or even our place to try and twist the law in a way that tries to help President, former President Trump uh, in the middle of a case or cases in Georgia and, and New York so that he can try and get them to federal court. We've got a good federal regime on this issue. It's been in place for decades. I think we should leave it alone, and uh, President Trump can still file his motions in, in state court to see if he can get it moved to federal court. We'll let the judges decide, but why don't we leave this to the courts uh, and allow them to follow the law and the evidence instead of trying to intervene yet again and influence improperly local state uh, prosecutions uh, in a way that puts our thumbs on the scale in a way that is really inappropriate for the House of uh, Representatives to do it. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen, goes back. Is there further discussion? 
Uh, seeing no further uh, discussion, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. Are those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 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 The uh, no's appear to have it. The gentleman from New York requests a roll call. Uh, the uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Ms. Hageman. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Nagus. Mr. Nagus votes aye. Ms. McBath. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivy. Aye. Mr. Ivy votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Aye. Ms. Ballant votes aye. Mr. Isa. Mr. Isa votes no. Ms. Bartz, you're not recorded. Ms. Bartz votes no. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Ms. McBath, you are not recorded. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Escobar, you're not recorded. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Hageman, you're in, Ms. Hageman, you are not recorded. Ms. Hageman votes no. So, oh, Aaron, what's happening? Huh? Okay, so, so I'm just, I'm just trying.
Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Chairman, there are 33 votes pending on the floor. We should move this. Do you, do you really want to go cast 33 votes right now? Wouldn't you rather just stick with one? <laughs> 33 votes are important. For what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? I seek recognition to call for regular order. We are in the process of observing regular order, just very slowly. <laughs> Mr. Massey, you are not recorded. Mr. Massey votes no. Have all members voted? Clerk will report the roll. Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and 16 noes. Well, the vote being 16, the affirmative 16, and the negative, this does not constitute a majority, and the amendment is not agreed to. Is there further discussion on the uh, uh, an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Seeing none, I'll, I'll recognize Mr. myself. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is going to be reported out, um, but as if this goes to the floor, I intend to offer an amendment dealing with uh, the exemption for someone charged with fraud. The, the general lady has that prerogative, but she doesn't have uh, uh, leave to, to speak on the bill. She's already spoken. Uh, well, I'm just uh, presenting a 
summary. We appreciate that. I thank that. you. I yield back. Uh, I will recognize myself uh, uh, simply to say that uh, you know, for, for the Democrats who think that we're all in lockstep step for Donald Trump, I, I want to point out I've endorsed Ron DeSantis. This isn't about Donald <laughs> Trump. Uh, you know, I've argued passionately ag against a possible shutdown of the government, so it's not about that either. Um, uh, and by the way, so have many Republicans on this dais. Uh, this bill is about the rule of law and the legal and social conventions that make our democracy possible in the first place. For, for, for nearly two and a half centuries, we've resisted the temptation to, to weaponize the law to affect the outcome of elections or to intimidate opponents into silence. And there are many of us who are supporting other candidates than Mr. Trump who are appalled by the tactics of the left that have so brazenly twisted the law in order to meet bald partisan promises that they made to left-wing constituencies as a condition of their election to these offices. Uh, it's not irrational in such a politically charged atmosphere to be mistrustful of a DA who's promised to bring down a candidate or who's concocted a, a novel use of, of law in order to do so, and, and then brought an indictment in a jurisdiction where more than 90% of the voters are in lockstep. You know, Alan Dershowitz has- Parliamentary a, inquiry, in, inquiry, Mr. Uh, parliamentary Chairman. inquiry cannot interrupt a, a speech. Do you have a point of order? Have, yeah, the point of order is what, you have no business speaking right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking on the ANS. I haven't speaking oh, he's speaking on the ANS, yeah. okay. I was going to say, Alan Dershowitz has, has an important uh, a test when it comes to matters such as this. Uh, what if the shoe were on the other foot? You know, we've reached a time when, when local uh, uh, leftist prosecutors, uh, who, who both ran on platforms of bringing down Donald Trump through the power of their offices, and who both share a reputation for being leftist political activists, I mean, suppose, suppose um, you know, you used to love this term, uh, a, a mega activist. Suppose two mega activists campaigned on bringing down Joe Biden or, or Barack Obama or Michelle Obama by all means necessary, and they were elected on that basis, and then they proceeded to make good on that threat by the most tortured interpretations of state law, and then, and then to hear these cases in a deep red jurisdiction that voted 90% for Donald Trump. Would we not want to protect the office of presidency and, and those who serve in it from such harassment as this? Whether the targets Donald Trump or Barack Obama, to, to abuse the law, to exact political revenge is abhorrent and self-destructive to our political system. And by the way, you can contest my representations of what's going on, but it's not, it's not just the fact that matters, it is the perception of what's going on by a minority of the population where that becomes destructive to, to, to confidence in our democracy. This bill does not prevent the prosecution of former presidents under state law. It simply says that if the target of a local prosecution is a president of the United States, it's got to be heard in a federal court to assure that one-sided parochial political prosecutions uh, are going to uh, be heard in a federal venue um, where we would have greater insulation from partisan motives and greater confidence in the impartiality and fidelity Point of that of parliamentary yes. inquiry. And with, and, and, and with that, I yield back. Mr. Is Chairman, further I discussion? move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, as a resident of Manhattan, who proudly supported Alvin Bragg in the Democratic primary, what was it, two years ago, uh, I frankly resent the insinuations about Mr. Bragg. Uh, Mr. Bragg is a very honest prosecutor. He did not campaign on a platform of, uh, uh, um, um, related to Mr. Trump. Um, and if he had, it would still be up to him to convince a jury of Mr. Trump's peers. The same goes for Fannie Willis in, uh, in whatever county that is in Georgia. I don't know what she campaigned on, but she has to convince a jury of Mr. Trump's peers of his guilt if, she, if, if, if he's to be uh, uh, convicted. And a former president of the United States is bedrock constitutional law, no different in, in, in law or justice or standing from any other citizen of the United States. If I thought that I wasn't getting a fair share, uh, a fair break, I should say, from the district attorney in my county because I was indicted for something, 
I wouldn't think that I had the right to remove it to federal court because I didn't like the DA. The same is true of Mr. Trump. And the fact that this bill is being offered for only one person, Donald J. Trump, and it only applies to Mr. Trump by its terms. For any, there's only one person who fits it, any f former president of the United States who is under criminal indictment, is a testament to the fact that the Republican Party who is supporting it are enthralled to Donald Trump and are afraid of the normal operations of the justice system lest he be convicted. And he may be convicted or acquitted in Georgia. He may be convicted or acquitted in New York. New York. He may be acquitted or convicted in the federal prosecution in uh, 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 Florida. He may be acquitted or convicted in the federal prosecution in, uh, in, here in Washington. But that's not our concern as a Congress. That is the concern of the justice system. We have always had faith, and, and the American system demands faith in the fair administration of justice. If Mr. Trump is convicted in any of those jurisdictions, Mr. and if he thinks that there is something wrong with that conviction, something improper, something unjust, he has the right to appeal, perhaps up to the United States Supreme Court, which is not notably unsympathetic to him. So we do not need this legislation. Not only do we not need it, this legislation is poison. It is subversive of every, no, of every notion of constitutional law and fairness and justice that we've ever had. I am very upset that members of this committee would seek to undermine the justice system of the United States the way this bill does. I yield back. Would you yield, you, you yield Mr. Mr. Nadler? I yield to Ms. Dean. Recognition. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. I associate myself with everything you just said. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, if somehow this unconstitutional proposal moves in some way forward, uh, a proposal that is meant to, to um, avoid justice and offer obstruction and protection for a single man, uh, I will be offering an amendment that would create an exception to this legislation for causes of action related to rape to make sure that prosecutors are not stripped of their right and responsibility to hold rapists <coughs> accountable for sexually assaulting another person in that state's jurisdiction. I yield back to Mr. Cohen. I yield, I yield to Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. I would, in Mr. McClintock's address, he was talking about prosecutors and claiming they might be trying to do something political. This would relate to Ms. E. Jean Carroll in her civil case. Mr. Dandler, would you agree that Ms. E. Jean Carroll should not have to go to federal court to get her civil case heard? I certainly would. That would be just, and, and she didn't campaign on anything before she was attacked at Bergdorf Goodman. She didn't say, I'm going to get him, and that's why I'm going to go into this uh, women's room with him. It's, it's just wrong. It's wrong to change the law for any one person, and it's unconstitutional on its face. Chairman. Yo to the gentlelady from Texas. And that's the clarification I want to make. I heard her member earlier discuss why would we be doing this and what is the basis, the legal basis. There is no legal basis for this exception to the former president. It is for him to be able to seek removal with no requirements, no criteria. And so I intend to prospectively introduce an amendment dealing with the issue of fraud and that if you are convicted or charged of fraud, as it is in the New York case in the, uh, given by the Attorney General of New York, just like the court said there, uh, the judge indicated, agreed that Mr. Trump committed fraud when he sent those statements regarding his wealth to the bank. General, and the point is, that should not be, uh, if you will, allowed time to uh, willy-nilly, to willy-nilly, to willy-nilly uh, be moved. Regular order, Mr. Court. Chairman. My time has expired. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, if there's no further discussion, the question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, this will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting on the bill. Uh, those in favor of the amendment in the nature of a substitute say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 The ayes appear to have it. And the uh, uh, and the amend the amendment. Uh, uh, is uh, 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 the amendment in the nature of a substitute is adopted. Uh, the reporting quorum being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. Those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered. A roll call. Roll call is requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Isa. Yes. Mr. Isa votes yes. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Yes. Mr. Gates votes yes. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes yes. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. Uh, on the amendment to, on, on, on the, uh, yes, aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz votes yes. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley. Ms. Hageman. Ms. Hageman votes yes. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran votes yes. Ms. Lee. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes aye. Mr. Nadler. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen. Ms. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes no. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes no. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivy. Mr. Ivy votes no. Ms. Ballant. Ms. Ballant votes no. Clerk will report the roll. I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, have all members voted? Mr. Biggs? Yes. Mr. Biggs votes yes. Any other member wish to vote? Clerk will report the roll. Mr. Chairman, there are 18 ayes and 15 noes. The ayes have it. The bill is reported favorably to the House. Uh, members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, uh, the bill reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. That concludes the committee's business for this meeting. Uh, this meeting is uh, adjourned.